All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Early Learning Council meeting uh, for February 10th, 2021. And I'm going to ask Remy to call the roll. And at the beginning, I want to excuse our five agency directors who are members of the council and have um, other commitments, meetings, hearings that they're testifying at. So they'll all be excused. We expect Miriam Calderon, um, who's the director of the early learning division to join us um, probably around 1.30 or two, but the others may drop in and out, um, but we'll see what their schedules allow. So Remy, will you call the rest of the roll? Yes, of course. Um, Angie Blackwell? Here. Katie Brooks? I'm here. Peter Buckley? Here. Uh, Ann Kubish? Here. Uh, George Mendoza? I'm guessing he's coming. Yes, who is, I believe he's coming. Um, Dr. Peg Miller? Here. Kali Thorne Ladd? Here. And then Sue Miller Chair? Here. Thanks, Remy. We're going to start our meeting as we have been um, in recent history with an acknowledgement of the, the tribal history in our state. And we're very fortunate to have Angie Blackwell as a member of our council. And she is also a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. So Angie is going to be leading us in um, this remembering. So Angie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sue, and I really appreciate this opportunity to participate in this process and, and all of the Council's time in indulging us. So today's review um, of Essential Understanding number five is identity, and I'm not going to be using any specific examples of any of the Oregon tribes today. This, what I share is going to be regarding all the tribes in Oregon and no specific examples. Um, and for those of you following along, um, that there there is um, information in your packet um, of the essential understanding. And I'm just gonna start with just borrowing from the first sentence there. Native American identities are alive, vibrant, and diverse. Um, end of quote, um, and now beginning my commentary. So like all beings, Native American identity is multidimensional and it's influenced by many social uh, cultural and political influences or factors. I want to just start by talking a little bit about some of the historical factors that have affected um, how Native Americans experience their identity today. And I'm going to start with relocation. So tribes across the US were moved from their ancestral homelands to reservations, um, many of which may not have been part of their ancestral homelands. And in doing this, removing people from, first of all, their sense of place where they had been belonged and their ancestors for millennia, but also removing them from their traditional food sources or their traditional hunting and gathering um, methods, maybe relocating them to a reservation where there were tribes that spoke many different languages and ultimately uh, having to adopt a new common language so all of these things that affect um, our identity um, being changed forcefully so um, with relocation, which would be back in um, the mid 1800s, let's say. And relocation was just the beginning. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the boarding school um, concept. Many Native American children were removed from their homes um, unwillingly and put into boarding schools with the with the express intent to erase that cultural identity, um, to um, change appearances, so haircut, um, dress change, language forbidden. Um, so for these kinds of reasons, there are generations of families in which identity or that heritage was denied, um, either based on fear or even shame. So there's a lot of rebuilding that's still taking place across the country, um, especially for tribes like mine where we were terminated for 29 years. So um, those are some historical um, 
impacts on a culture identity. But let's talk also about contemporary factors that may affect that cultural identity. One being um, obviously the people that don't live near a reservation. Um, we have lots of urban Indians, people that live um, in the city that may not be associated or affiliated directly with their tribe, or they've been removed from their tribe for whatever reason and may lack access um, to some of the things that help to develop that identity and connection. Another topic that's really actually quite painful for some is those that identify as Native American because of their ancestry and um, how they're raised, but maybe don't meet the criteria for membership within their tribe. So this really creates um, complication in reconciling. I am Native American, my family's Native American, but my tribe won't let me belong because I don't meet whatever that criteria is. And so that those are some contemporary issues. And I mentioned before that each tribe has the, the ability to define their own criteria for membership. So it's different for everyone. And it's not always just based on the degree of blood quantum. Um, it could be based on um, whether you lived on or near the reservation at the time of your birth or whether your parents lived on the reservation. There's a lot of factors. Um, lastly, I'll just say that, um, and uh, this is obvious to you all, but the identity is not typically something that you can visibly see. Um, how people express and experience their identity. It could be, you know, it could be something that's visible, but um, there are a lot of people that are not going to present that physically, but um, have an identity as Native American and experience and express that in different ways. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate this opportunity to share this information. And um, I always welcome questions when, there's, when time allows or even private questions in the chat box or to my email. And my last disclaimer, I'm not an expert, but, um, but I'm here and happy to share. Thanks. Sue, so you're on mute, I think. <laughs> Sorry, thank you, Angie. Um, and I was saying to myself <laughs> that, um, you have lived experience, so as far as I'm concerned, you are an expert. And your, your comment about um, generations of tribal members to have been, their identity has been denied. I think that is something that we're certainly aware of. And I know Kali is talking about that in the racial justice um, conversations that are going on. So um, I think that is something we as a council will certainly be talking about as well. So thank you, Angie. Nicely done. And this is actually a, a great segue into our um, next agenda item, which is the talk to talk about equity. And you remember council back at our retreat in October, we said that um, equity and talking about how it um, relates to Raise Up Oregon, how it relates to the work the council is doing or can be doing, and really how it relates to what each of us is doing in our own networks, our professional lives, as well as our personal lives. And just wanting to get more um, breadth and depth of understanding around that. So fortunately, we've got Carrie McCann with us. We all know her um, from the BUILD um, initiative. And I'll let uh, Carrie introduce Sherry, who's joining us today. And on behalf of the council, Sherry, I want to welcome you and thank you for being a part of this conversation. So Carrie, I will turn it over to you with uh, gratitude. That's, uh, thank you, Sue. Um, actually, Sherry, I was going to give you a moment to introduce yourself while I get the slides up, and then I'll kick us off, and then Sherry and I are going to trade back and forth and hope to engage into, in some conversations with you as well. Well, great. 
so much, um, Sue, for that warm introduction. And thank you, Angie, um, because I think your comments really lay the foundation for some of what we're going to talk about. And Sue gave a hint that Kali cares about these issues as well. Um, and clearly what we're gonna to present to you is about taking action, um, understanding at the personal level, the history and the trauma is important, but as a council, your job in my opinion is to take action to remediate and not continue to um, create opportunities for inequity. Um, I come to you with um, multiple experiences. I spent six years at the Annie E. Casey Foundation as VP of Human Development and Operations. I was a commissioner in Massachusetts from 2009 to 2013 of the Department of Early Education and Care. Um, I've been with the BUILD Initiative since 2013. Um, and in that role, I'm co-director with Carrie of State Services, but also responsible for systems alignment and integration. And as a part of that work, I manage uh, Equity Leaders in Action Network, which we had the privilege of having several um, folks from Oregon participate in, and we're about to launch a second um, ELAN. Also have community experience because I think that full connection is important. I started my career as a nurse um, and got a doctorate in counseling psychology, but did work as a home visitor um, in Baltimore City, um, which was a tough city at that time in the 70s and 80s, and also um, worked in two empowerment zones, um, one under the Clinton administration, the other under Bush in Baltimore and New Haven, Connecticut. And I happen to live in New Haven, Connecticut right now, but you all have one of my daughters. My youngest daughter lives in Portland um, and moved there on a whim three years ago and hasn't come home yet. So I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, so what we wanted to do is kind of start out and share a little bit about where we're coming from so that that could be a foil and a jumping off point for us to hear from you about how does this embed um, into the work that you've already thought about. And we thought we might try to have a concrete conversation about the town halls we've been brainstorming about and have proposed but haven't kind of moved it forward or made a final decision about it. So as you know, uh, Sherry and I work with states uh, leaders who really seek to unify and coordinate early childhood systems that really the end result is to improve young children and their family outcomes. You know a lot of my work that's kind of captured on the left side of this slide of how I interact with the council, with the early learning division and with, with RUAC. On the right hand side, as you think about Sherry's opening comments is really thinking about that what we're trying to do as an organization with you is highlight best practices and innovative approaches. We often are facilitating learning communities around those and then really trying to be knowledge brokers on promising practices, especially around system building. So as today, we're gonna to kind of explore and share a little bit of our why and what does that mean for your why of doing this work. We're gonna share with you the build approach to equity work and how do we think about it connected to early childhood system building. And then the conversation with you is really about it. how does this help us think about the next steps and how equity is embedded in the work that you're already doing with one another. When we have conversations around commitments, this is what we often share with groups. And I think you have a lot of these practices that I've just observed naturally with one another. Um, kind of the left-hand side is really about how each of you have stayed engaged. I think there's times in conversations when we're trying to figure things out that we experience discomfort, discomfort and wanna sit with that. Um, we hope that each of you will speak your truth, that these conversations are not neatly um, tied with a bow that there will be non-closure to a lot of our conversations as we are trying to figure things out and trying things and then learning from them and then trying them again. Um, really assuming positive intent from your colleagues, owning your own learning and really the means of interactions and, and respect of other people's ways of communicating and doing this work. Um, for, um, for the commitments, you can see here that we're asking you to be critical thinkers with us of looking for what challenges you're thinking instead of what confirms it. Uh, we all are coming to this work with humility as learners from one another and not in the expert relationship. We're seeking to have dialogue and really have hope for that we are a part of making a better future. 
Um, the goals of our equity work is really to support leaders on questioning assumptions and how things work around building your interpersonal relationships and networks with the people that you need to make the improvements and especially with the social networks of people that do not look like you. Um, we really want to help identify inequities and learn how they're perpetuated so that we really can take action to interrupt those and really address the needs of how the systems and structures have marginalized families and remove those disparities. The feature of our work is really, as um, Sherry started to open up, is really we want to embed this in the current work. We don't see equity as, a, as work that you do on the side. We really want to make it a part of what you do. So we want to recognize you as council members. What is your existing role, responsibilities, and areas of influence? How do we think about that? How do we think about that in your relationship with your state agency director partnerships and the other kind of cross-sector partners that you have? We intend that our equity work helps accelerate or advance the current work so that it will be more successful. And kind of what are the, uh, the agreement of efforts for you guys, it would be between the council and your state agency and legislative partners. We often work within state agencies and across state agencies within kind of the leadership structure as well as the cross sector nature of the work. Um, we want to recognize intersectionality. We often say to achieve equity, it actually takes all of us. If health makes some progress by themselves, but education and human services aren't, then we won't actually achieve the kind of equity outcomes we want to see. And this is all grounded in situation of local context, right? We want this work to make sense and resonate and tailor it to the different communities around Oregon. So in thinking about our equity work, we're just gonna give you a few slides on the frame. You know, first of all, for me, if you're doing equity, you're thinking about a specific population of children and families and how state programs, policy structure, you could say community, you could say local, if you have influence and authority there, benefit children and family. So if we're talking about black children, we should say that Somali children, and we should be using our data and we'll get to that in a minute to make that decision. But the opportunity is to see a group of children and families and think about how to benefit them and what's necessary to support their well-being. In our work, um, when I say equity and I say action, I'm talking about four things. I wanna increase opportunities for children and the adults who care for really young children. I wanna remove barriers to those opportunities. I wanna distribute resources in ways that are fair and do extra for folks who have the greatest challenge. And I want mechanisms in place to make sure that I'm getting the result that I say I want. So often we do things and we don't monitor to make sure we're getting the result. So when we talk about taking action, it's increasing opportunities, removing barriers, distributing and monitoring. And I'm not talking about new resources. I'm talking about being critical about the universal opportunities that are already available. New resources are fine, but that's not what our children and families need to wait for. We need to be thinking about how we use the universal things that are available. We have a framework um, of saying, you know, we recognize and I really appreciate Angie's opening, um, sharing some additional knowledge, um, giving us a chance to reflect and be critical. Um, we wanna think and act strategically. We want opportunities to act both within your council and as Carrie opened up, we hope that you see this as an opportunity to act within your own roles and works. And in order to do that, you have to have networks. So we boiled this down to five characteristics in a process that we think is important. And we're gonna um, blow some of those up, Carrie, in a second. But one, we focus on leaders and leadership. Um, we really do believe leaders and leadership have within their roles, responsibility, influence, and authority, the ability to make a difference. We wanna use data in planning, decision-making and monitoring and not just quantitative data, but qualitative data, which will also get to your idea of town halls as an opportunity to really listen to children and their families and the workforce and other community leaders. 
We want to build at the interpersonal level so that you're understanding the root causes. Um, often our programs are a band-aid on something that's got a deeper um, issue. You know, the need for subsidized care is because people don't have living wage jobs. We need to be woken or working on both and if we care about children and families. And that the change happens at multiple levels. It's not enough that any in one of us gets smarter, although that's important. It is important that we build relationships with people outside of our social network, as Carrie mentioned, and really build interpersonal relationships with those we intend to benefit. We want to change institutional policy practice and programs. That is really your job as a council and also through the council to work on structural relationships because you can get early learning right, but if folks don't have access to health and healthcare, we've seen the result of that somewhat during COVID and transportation and higher ed and other segments of the system. And in order to do equity well, We've got to work with people, programs, and structures, and we've got to be able to listen and respond to those that are doing the service as well as those we intend to serve. So where Sherry and I always start is what is our why? And one of our favorite things to do, and we have favorite articles that we use that um, Sherry's the one who taught me, just look around and see what motivates you of why you do this and where does it show up in our news? And then what we like to do is kind of look for in each of our states that we work, what are we seeing in the news that pops out to us around our why. So this is an article that I found from earlier this year that's really looking at the impacts of higher education, salary structures, and housing policies to really explain the economic disparities of the Black and African American populations in Oregon and what would it mean to change those things and change that situation for that population. Um, another article is really what Sherry started to highlight is the distinction that the pandemic has really highlighted that I think most of us already knew, but really how you're doing and how, if you're surviving and how you're experiencing this pandemic isn't um, related to the virus itself. It doesn't discriminate. It really is related to the healthcare system you had access to ahead of time. And then where are you going and how are you accessing healthcare now? Um, I found this article about really around how are we providing opportunities for our children and then how does that result in the kind of economic success of our state. And so this article really looked at the disparities of opportunities connected to education. So I think we think of it less as an achievement gap of individual children and more of an opportunity gap of what are children and families having access to, especially during their early childhood years, but it has a real impact for us in Oregon. Um, if housing is what motivates you, this is really an article about the intersection of housing policies, where do people live, under what kinds of conditions, and then when you add climate change on top of that, what's the impact and how are those impacting families' health and housing safety in relationship to where they live right now. And then this one is about the health, another health example related to specifically early childhood around maternal and infant mortality and the kind of disparities that we have in Portland and that were very similar to the rest of the country of the kinds of structural and systems that are impacting women and their outcomes for themselves and their babies. So Sherry's gonna help us uh, continue the why conversation. So Carrie picked those articles and you all could pick other articles. You could also have a conversation about privilege and intersectionality and implicit bias. The point on the next slide is that these are interlocking structural issues that when you talk about equity, and again, Angie gave the best example opening up where you live, what food you have access to, how you think about your own identity, all of those things work together either to create opportunity or deny opportunity. Um, child welfare policies, housing policies, mass incarceration. Um, Carrie mentioned the educational system, opportunity for wage, at not only wage, but equal opportunity around wage amounts and gender structures. All of these things play into our ability to address inequity. 
And so facing our country is some essential work for us to do. You know, race is a social construction. And if it's an area you haven't read about, I encourage you to. It was done for a purpose. In fact, um, it, we, it has no biological significance. Um, inequality is grounded in historic disenfranchisement and exclusion of groups. And if we had more time, there are video clips that do much of what Angie did around a whole range of people. It is actually it, decisions that people made that excluded. And what we're asking folks to do now, and lots of us are working hard to get done, is to make a different set of decisions. And that history has led to these higher levels of poverty and segregation, um, leaving some people with opportunity and others with lots of barriers, even to those universal opportunities that we think should be available. So we wanted to pause here and just check in to see if there are any questions, if people want to share either their why or how this helps you as we set up the conversation as we move forward. The only thing I would just, uh, this is kind of an aside, but I want to add if people have not read the book Cast um, by Isabella Wilkerson, she really lays this out very well. The idea, you know, the fact that it is a social construct and how it's been used intentionally to keep people at different levels of essentially what we have uh, as a caste system in the United States. And so I just wanted to put that forward because as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking of that book and I would encourage my colleagues on the council to read it if they have, as they have time. Yeah, and, and if reading's not what you wanna do, Carrie can pop you a couple podcasts that are great where actually Oprah Winfrey interviews some, it interviews Isabel Wilkerson, but also brings some other examples to bring it alive. So if you don't have time to read the book there, I think it's a series of six or eight Kelly that are um, podcasts that will give you the, the high level messages, but that's absolutely right. It's a great reference. And it compares the United States um, with two other countries too. So it shows you how it's embedded in our system, but compares it to other mm -hmm. countries. Yeah, it looks at Germany and India. Yeah, and thank particularly you. how Holocaust Germany actually looked to the United States to figure out how to create their system mm -hmm. to oppress uh, the Jewish people. It's very fascinating. Yeah. yeah, I've read that book and I think that was the most eye-opening, devastating part of the book for me is the Nazis came here to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah staggering. Um, I would just throw out the comment that I appreciate um, the number of times both of you, Sherry and Carrie, have talked about how this is cross-sector, you know, interagency wraparound um, work that we need to do. And as you both know, that's exactly where Race Up Oregon is. Mm -hmm. So that certainly aligns with what we're doing. I think um, certainly understanding the root causes and then figuring out where or how we can affect some of those is um, a conversation that we might want to have, but we certainly haven't touched on that yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you all for that. Can I just jump in also? I just really appreciated that um, that summary and really appreciate this perspective and glad that we're talking about it. I too am a big fan of the Isabel Wilkerson, Wilkerson's book. One of the things that is very much on my mind, you, you introduced the notion of intersectionality and I think you were talking about it in terms of the different kinds of systems that that, that need to be aligned in order to reduce structural inequalities and so on. And I, another way that in the, in the in the racial equity world that we talk about intersectionality is also about the multiple, the multiple disadvantages that people experience as a result of race or gender and so on. And one of the things um, that I focus on a lot and I think is really important in a state as big as Oregon for us to remember is also the intersectionality with geographic isolation and the, inner, and the lack of capacity, the lack of access, the lack of investment in rural areas. And that when you overlay the intersectionality of, of race, gender, ability, et cetera, with also geographic isolation and underinvestment in rural areas, you have extreme disadvantage for people of color who live in rural areas. Also kids who are white, who are really poor, who live in rural areas. But 
I, I really think in, I'd like to remind us in our state in Oregon where so many of our, 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 so much of our population is still in rural areas. So many of our kids are in rural areas that that is another disadvantage that we have to overlay um, and include into our analysis. Um, and the intersectionality for rural kids of color, the, the multiple disadvantages that they are facing is extraordinary and they have to be put, um, I think at the top of our list as well. Mm -hmm. Can I say one other thing? Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> and I appreciate you mentioning that. And I think um, the data also bears out that children in rural areas, um, their challenges in education uh, mirror in many ways what we see in urban communities of color. And so the fact that the outcomes are very similar, I think if we were just going off the data, we know that our highest risk children, our highest need are our children in rural areas and our children of color in metro regions. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I often look at the data and think about how similar they are and yet how worlds apart those communities tend to be seen. And it, it, I, somehow we have to figure that out. Well, Kali, I, I thank you for saying that. And I've thought about this a lot. I think about it a lot from the perspective of the rural urban divide and how who we are as a state and yeah. how we can find common cause. Yeah. And I believe that our, I think that you have put your finger on exactly it. How our young, uh, how the young people of our state are educated is a place around which rural and urban can find common cause. And, you know, our best, our best performing schools are the ones that are in sort of the well-resourced suburban communities, not surprisingly, because we know about how property tax funds it. And so the ones that are at most disadvantaged are the in, inner city schools catering to kids of color and rural community. And I think if we could get that, that could be a powerful rallying point. I really think it is because no, everybody cares about kids, you know? And so it's, so it's, I agree with that so much. I mean, that really helps us transition to the next slide where we could actually spend our whole time thinking about root causes. So soon maybe we should think about how that conversation comes back around related to the raise up organ priorities. Um, this comes from Cracking the Code, which is a documentary which you can access online and use with other groups of really understanding this kind of infinity cycle of how the internal and the external uh, relate to each other and reinforce each other of who has power and the economics to determine who has access to opportunity and who doesn't and how that is situated within our history, our culture and our identity. So I think this kind of summarizes for all of us what we've been talking about so far of how the um, personal around each of us having a set of biases, privileges and internalized racism interacts with our world where there's social networks, institutional and structural um, ways of being that help some people do well and other people not do well and how that then interacts with one another. So as we think about our work together, we, and you see the take action before of our action. That's why we think about the four levels where they interact, but it also with Bill thinking about systems and early childhood structures, why we spend a lot of time on the right-hand side of where's the interpersonal work, institutional and structural work that we wanna do. Sherry, anything else before I move on to the next one? Okay. No, that's good. And then well, one of the other concepts that Sherry raised for us of the five ways for leaders to be president in the equity work is around this work with people, programs, and structures to build the early childhood system. And we just want to use this graphic, not because you can necessarily on a screen like this, read every single world word, but it's to show the complexity of what we're talking about. Often I show you guys the build ovals that shows a really neat and well-designed early childhood system. And that is not actually our reality. Sherry and I often think of this picture as more of our reality of local, regional, state, federal. And then we have our five cross-sector teams. And then we have all the different variety of programs that you see on the outside of the circle of the kinds of things that we're all trying to interact with coordinate and align and really figure out who's contributing root causes and who are experiencing disparities. So if transportation is a root cause for why people can't access to certain kinds of services, what does that mean for the services and where they're located and what they're trying to do? But what does it mean for us to actually try to tackle transportation from kind of an early childhood perspective? And we know that our like housing partners are at the table as one of our root causes around housing policy, taxes and that kind of thing 
has a uh, direct impact about what resources we have for programs and who can provide them. And then you've seen this before, so I'll spend less time here. But again, this is where we're continuing to try to figure out frameworks that will help you organize your work and think about where you can take action. But we spent more time on this at the retreat. So I'll turn this over to Sherry so we have more time on the other two. Right, and we want to make sure we get this in early, this idea of leadership. Um, Carrie, you can go to the next slide. It's, there are things that people do every day that can either increase inequities or maintain inequities. Um, leaders interpret policy, they modify policy, they modify practices, they provide opportunities and build a workforce and leadership. <coughs> and then <coughs> you have the opportunity to modify or create new legislation, although that's not the primary tool. And I think us being aware that we're making these decisions is a critical part of taking action towards equity. I have been challenging states to ask for a report on all the exceptions that somebody made over any period of time, six months, three months, and see where those exceptions are coming in and what kind of exceptions are you making and determining whether those things really need to be rules or not. But when we're going out, and I know you're gonna have a conversation about your town halls and your listening, often it's flexibility that folks are asking for in policies um, or interpretation of policies or practices or getting leadership in the workforce to think and work in a different way. And on workforce, I wanna be clear that we could get it right at this table, but if we're not talking to the person that answers the phone in the community, we will still miss the boat. And I had the privilege of doing that, being a leader with right-headed thinking, but when you go out into the community and you talk to the people on the front line, they sometimes still are holding on to old ideas. So you really do have to work throughout the entire system. Um, I just wanna show a couple of slides. Um, this is around federal tribal relationship that how we think about the population that we're thinking about and supporting matters. Love this article, it's on the history of federal tribal relationships. But on the one side, you see what Angie was talking about, about the different ways they thought about policy. They were removing, they were placing people in reservation. They were trying to get folks to assimilate. Then they said, oh, you had a rule. And thank God we're now at self-governance. That's a long history that goes back to the 1600s. And on the other, that is how government thought about the people. And so as a black person, there's been a time where people thought about people who didn't have education or didn't work as lazy versus thinking they didn't have access to opportunity. Next slide. And policy makes a difference in the article. And this is just one snapshot looking at 1960 to present. There have been all these policies that have been passed, major laws, that determine the relationship between tribes and the community. Now I'm showing you from a tribal perspective, but we could do this from a black perspective. We could certainly do it from an immigration perspective. So policy matters, the relationships matter and what we think about the people that we're trying to support does impact the decisions that we make. So it's critical to really understand the history and legacy of the current realities of racism. It's critical that we act and identify strategies and best practices that disrupt and increase access to opportunity and better outcomes. Leaders have to work across systems to disrupt the systematic and structural inequities. You can't build a high quality childcare center on a community college campus and there's no way to get there. You've got to be thinking about transportation if you do that. And many communities that have huge gorgeous colleges where you can put a high quality center also have their own transportation system which the residents in that community can't ride, which means they don't have necessarily access to this new thing that you created. And leaders most importantly, and I think it's just foundational, have to work to listen to the experiences and perspectives of those most affected by the programs and the policies. Um, and that needs to be an ongoing feedback loop that we'll continue to talk about um, later. I'm gonna go quickly through these data slides because it's your 
data and you know it, but we really think both quantitative, the numbers and qualitative, the interviews and the conversations with people is important. We think it's important. You're talking to people in your programs, but as important, and maybe to Anne's point, talking to people who are not benefiting from your programs. We also want to look at data that thinks about the root cause, what is really causing, what is our explanation for why they're disparate outcomes. We want to uncover strategies and actions that really address those root causes. And sometimes that's not us, that's somebody else. And we want to continue to monitor. And in that vein, we use lots of data sources, the county health rankings to really try to identify where we should go listen. So often we go to the place that's convenient where we know somebody where we already have a social network. Um, next slide, I'm gonna challenge you to use a data process to really figure that out. This is just showing you the Oregon county health rankings. You could pick um, the data, next slide, that you wanted to use. But if you use the county health ranking, these would be the top 10 places that you'd be trying to go to listen. And these are probably some of the places Anne mentioned that aren't close, not easy to get to. Um, we've done visits where we had to get on a bus for five hours to get there. And yep, we should get on the bus and go five hours to get there versus expecting them to come to the Capitol. Next slide. Another way is looking at the opportunity index. This helps you think about the intersectionality of economy, education, health, and community. And here again, you see what they would call the top 10 or more places that are receiving a C around these multiple indicators that help you understand the well being of children and families. This next one looks at a social deprivation index. Um, and again, you see the counties with the worst social deprivation index scores. And it again is looking at single parent households. It's looking at rented housing units, overcrowding households without a car. And so we take the, all of that data and we say, okay, if you looked at all those things, where are the 10 places you should go? And so my challenge um, to you is to think about how you could create opportunities to listen in these places. If you wanna throw in another data angle, that's fine, Khalid, sounds like you had some and see if you get the same answer. You may have other reasons for going other places. We also tried to triangle the number of children living in poverty as a reason to go. But so often we go where it's convenient, we go where we can drive through, we go where it's close to us. When in fact we wanna, if we can make it work in these places, then it will cascade and work in other places. Next slide. Oh, did we skip one? Oh, maybe I did. No, it's my fault. So the other side of data is listening to the people you intend to benefit. And I'm just going to do a couple slides on how we think about that. Um, this is a quote from a group that I did during COVID. So you can do virtual visits with families. They're interested in talking to you during COVID, especially if you say, how are you doing? because so many people are calling them about one piece or the other piece and listening is so important. Next slide. When we think about this, I call them beneficiary visits, um, community visits, family visits. We wanna listen and understand about families and their goals for children and the providers and their goals for young children. That's the first question. It's never about any particular program. It's like, what do you want for your children and families? We want to get their experience with disparities, what they think is available to other people, what's been their experience with institutions. I live in New Haven, Connecticut. Yale, if you know Connecticut at all, is a big institution. I did a family focus group. Um, it's just taped. I probably should say this, but three moms were not able to get pediatric appointments in the middle of COVID for three different reasons. That's not okay. So even though we think we've got this huge healthcare system where everybody should have access, three moms told different stories about how they were having trouble with that. We also want to understand how families have historically and today fought back, resisted, organized for self-determination. They're not waiting for your service. If it's universally available, their tax dollars are going to it. We should be working hard to make sure they have access to it. But they have a story to tell about how they made it, how they're continuing to take care of their children and their families. And you'd be surprised at some of the things that people sacrifice in order to do that. 
And then most important, hear what they say and apply those lessons to your, um, to your services as you're thinking about planning and designing and modifying. Nobody expects anything fixed overnight. It's a process. We also think that you gotta it be intentional about this, that it's a cycle of improvement over time, meaning you should be creating a feedback loop, not necessarily with the same families. I think it's important to have families on groups like these, but they represent one family unless we staff them so that they can go out in the community and get that voice and bring it back from all those areas that we just looked at. Um, and we want to share the challenges when we go back about what your team could respond to, what they couldn't respond to. Some of what you hear is gonna be local and not state. It's nice if you make a connection for them at the local level, but say, I heard this and I got it, but parks are not what the state does. We really need to talk to your mayor or your local councilman um, to do that. And just be honest about timelines and the pace of government. People appreciate that level of honesty. Carrie? Yeah, so we wanted to stop here for additional reflections and comments or questions from all of you, and then see if that transitioned us with the time we have remaining about thinking about what this could possibly make for the town halls. We know that you have this idea. We know that we've been still working it out on what its purpose would be. What's your role as community council members, your partnership with the agency directors. So we're happy to do that. Sherry's done a number of virtual um, beneficiary voice visits. So sh if you have questions about what does that look like as a council as we think about timing and when we might want to start, um, we're happy to take this in a couple of different directions. So I'll stop there and, and see if there's first comments or questions. I'll raise a question just in our experiences with the different, uh, different groups, different efforts. Um, the town halls that seem to work for us, if, the, is there, if there's a specific goal of the town hall and not, not just to gather information, because I, I think at least the families we work, people feel like they're, they're surveyed out, they're asked a lot of questions, but if there's a purpose, for instance, we're going to have a town hall to talk about um, this specific issue of kindergarten readiness or this specific issue uh, of uh, uh, how we're going to come back after the fire, uh, etc. Uh, those are more well attended and more people are more engaged than just a listing session. So that just a kind of comment and uh, just wanted to see whether we're thinking of listening sessions or we're thinking of actually trying to come up with a purpose for town halls, a goal. Yeah, one of the things in my practice is that you partner and if you pick the 10 places, take that as an example, you partner with a local nonprofit that's already engaged with families. And I think that makes the space for that more broader open conversation than a town hall where people are coming because I imagine then they want to know what they were coming for. So right. you're having the listening session built on a trusting relationship. And then that organization can be a part of the feedback loop and getting people additional feedback. And in COVID, you know, it's five to eight people. You gotta be able to get them all on the screen if you're really gonna have a conversation and no more than five to six questions. Um, I think there are times when there's a problem to solve and you can bring people together. Um, and usually that's got some sort of timeline. And I will say time or rushing or timelines are sometimes the enemy of equity because you really want to be in relationship with community so you can listen, come back and say, well, what do we do with that? And then go back and listen and then come back. And you need that ongoing feedback loop. So that community partner is what I think transitions it from a town hall to a ongoing relationship with state leaders. Yeah, and if I could just piggyback on that comment, I think, and, and we do a lot of work where we listen and learn and we're listening, we go, go into communities and listen first. And, and I think it's really important for people to understand what the information is going to be used for. This is worth my time to participate in this because I see that this information will feed into XYZ decision or that we are becoming partners and developing a plan for kids in our state and I have my voice is going to be there. So it can't, it has to, I think we have to tell them specifically what the information is going to be used for and how it's going to be used um, in order to, to, to sort of respect their time and their wisdom.
Other reflections or comments? So George, will you talk a little bit more about what you just put in the chat box and welcome to the council meeting. Thanks for uh, making time for this. Hi everyone. I, I was just saying, you know, whenever I do a town hall or participate in, in town halls, um, typically it's to go over an issue or a problem to solve. Um, sometimes it's just to give information. I'll just so it's sometimes it's just one way, but if it, in this matter, it's more of an issue or problem to solve or an initiative that you wish to implement or we are trying to implement. And then we ask the questions and then we, we listen and take the suggestions. And then we use that input to guide our decisions and our planning. So if it was at least presented in that way and then there was breakout sessions and there was people that were facilitators on certain questions and it really was a little bit more of a from my perspective, a personalized experience where um, you did get feedback with smaller groups of maybe five, 10, and, and you could have up to 50 people or 100 people in a large group, but then when you break them out, you can um, ask the facilitated questions and take notes and use that data and then collect all that data and at the end um, tabulate it and use it for meaning, a meaningful purpose. Um, that's where I've seen uh, town halls become effective if, if you're trying to really seek uh, guidance and, and information from, from, from the folks that are going to be impacted. And George, one other thing you reminded me to say is that I always say when you're doing these, you take down quotes, not notes, because notes are filtered through your biases, through your lens, through what you think you know and you're going to remember. And in our practice, and we could show you volumes of them if we had more time, we write down the quotes because when you take those quotes from meeting to meeting to meeting, each person is having their own interpretation based on exactly what the family said. Um, so in terms of documenting, that's just been a, a wonderful practice to onboard the people who weren't able to participate um, and to continue the work of moving the work forward. You know, one of the things, Sherry, that I was thinking about, about our beneficiary voice visit, that's a little different than the traditional way of hearing from community to implement something is what the data analysis does is it gives you your top 10 communities where the opportunities are not working. So the reason you're not going with an initiative or a project is that you're reaching out to a specific population of people to say, we thought we had good resources. We thought we were offering opportunities. Things aren't going well. You're doing things on your own. You're being your own advocates. Let's start to have a conversation to untangle your experiences, your dreams, your wants, and then how does that translate maybe to the feedback loop in the future work around how do we change our initiatives, programs, and services so that it, it works for that community. So it's a little bit different, right, than implementing, I know I'm gonna implement X and I wanna make sure it works for the community. This is places where things have been implemented and for one reason or another, it's not making it there or it's not working there. And that's what the data is telling us. Now we're gonna go find out like why. I remember Sherry, you were in one state and, um, and people thought early intervention just didn't work there. And then it turned out what you found out in the community is that there was a single pediatrician who didn't believe that early intervention could serve those kids and families and there was too long of a waiting list. So he was a gatekeeper and he didn't refer to anyone. So the conversation was a discovery of one example of one part of the system not working for that community. There were other ahas in that community, but, um, but it was just, it's a kind of investigatory, kind of that qualitative piece to, can we figure out what's going on in the 10 communities of our, of our state about why our current systems and structures aren't working for them? Yeah, really good point, Carrie. And, um, I appreciate your comment that's in the uh, chat box as well, Katie, because um, I know you've done a lot of community meetings, whether they're town halls or whatever you call them, um, around child care in Central Oregon. Yeah, we have. And um, no, I, I admit, I, I'm totally still. I'm totally committed to DEI and I totally still know I suck at really understanding it. I think it's, it's one of those things as a privileged white woman that you just constantly have to keep at a humble, persistent effort 
And one of the things that I've been struggling with lately with my chamber organization, we just had a conversation that I think is worth talking about here. This happened yesterday with my team. We're partnering with OSU, Cascades, on um, DEI education and, and kind of a summit in the spring. And we were all ready to gather these groups and get the word out. And then how do we incorporate the business voice into that? And, and it occurred to us yesterday that we were, were injecting what we systemically see as, oh, here's the problem and here's the solution and let's go ask. And we actually had a great meeting yesterday where we stopped and said, you know, I don't know what they want. And maybe they're tired of telling us what they want. So how about going out and talking with a few folks about, is this the right tool or not? Um, if you had something to walk away from this particular uh, event or this, this effort or workshop or these town halls, you walked away from it, what is it that you would want us to know? What's the most important thing? And so that got us to the conversation around who convenes it. And for minority families, um, I'm not sure the state is the person who should reach out. Maybe it's, it's the churches. I think uh, just putting some thought into who is a trusted group and how do you bring that group to the table? And, and I think we need to think long and hard about who are asking to come to the town halls and um, who does the asking. Yeah, Katie, that is a valuable point on two levels. One is that we in our practice use a local partner to identify the families, bring the families together, distribute a small token or stipend for people being willing to participate us because two things happen. One, they come and they tell a story, but they may tell a story that opens a trauma or a wound and you're not staying in town. And so by being connected to that local nonprofit or that local faith-based community, that can continue to get addressed. Um, and so it is critical that the state is not the convener, but rather a local partner who helps you frame what's important to these families is the convener. And in my practice, sometimes the local convener takes the protocol and they actually run the group and we get to listen. We've done them in Spanish and Arabic and other languages. And sometimes we're only a listener. Um, I do think going and listening from multiple angles is important if you can, but you should be flexible about who actually asks the questions and definitely work with someone local about bringing um, together the group. And, and I think that gets to your rule comment because if you go to local and say, well, how do people gather? Maybe they all gather around one computer at a time when they come together or there, or you do individual interviews. Um, I know in rural communities, sometimes we just do individual interviews with folks on the phone and the same five people ask the same five questions and put it together. But you do have to be flexible. If you call those places is where you wanna go, then you gotta decide what's the best way to go. Carrie, I know it's five o'clock. Um, yeah, yeah, um, Sue or Remy, or how are we doing on time? Um, we're doing well. We've got another um, 10 minutes that we can stay on this topic. I think I'm right about that. Um, yeah, we've got another 10 minutes. Okay, great. Um, so, so an interesting uh, piece of planning that this is bringing up. Um, I appreciated some, I hope we get to see your slides once yeah. this is all over. So yeah. we'll <laughs> they're full of, share. obviously filled with information. Mm -hmm. And the the data slides that you presented, Sherry, um, you said, well, I'll just zoom through these because it's your data so you know all of it. <laughs> right. Um, I'd like to see the data because I don't know all of it. But um, the health ranking, opportunity index, social deprivation index, I mean, I, I, obviously there's lots of data that is available. We usually talk about what's not available, but I think we would want to really put together a process carry that allowed us to figure out, so what is the data out there right. that's accessible? And then 
I've talked to all, every council member about this town hall possibility in the last month. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of us have been talking about, well, let's do a, a big one. Let's, you know, in, invite the world and have our partners invite families as well. Um, so be statewide. And we'll try to do some of the urban rural connection just by having a statewide conversation. What I'm hearing today is that it's much more localized than that, that you actually go into a community and find a partner to a trusted partner in the community to convene the meeting. And, and our role is, is very different, obviously. So I'd love to share your perspective and experience on big versus small and very targeted um, understanding. Yeah, we've got limited time, so we can't hit all a thousand communities in the state. I think you should think about that, though. I mean, I think a couple of things. One is you don't have to hit all thousand. I offered you 10. You can come up with another 10 that you want to own. I think there's ways that a part of your start to feed this into contracts and programs so that you're getting this ongoing feedback in an ongoing way. And the challenge with a large statewide is the rural issues that Ann mentioned or the Native American issues that um, Angie mentioned early on are lost in that. Um, or they compete against each other. I've been at the large meeting where you know everybody's doing some race to the bottom because there's a sense of competing over resources and you don't want that tension. You want to say, what do you want for your children and families? What, you know, what do you think other people have? What do you, you know, and you want to think about it in the context of that place. So if somebody says, I don't have access to health care and they're in a rural community where they have to go to the next town over in order to get health care, that makes sense to talk about. Different than somebody says, I don't have health care and they're in the backyard of a hospital. And so the, the situation is different, their experience is different, and you want to hear that. You want to allow them to tell that story. Um, and, and, and I don't think you should feel, when you say cover the whole state, you know, one day, but I think you should start at the places farthest from opportunity and then work your way in. And then this idea of listening to people is just, if you wanna do racial equity work, you wanna do um, work around racial justice, everybody's gotta do it. And so how are you putting this expectation out to other people who ask you for money or who are running and managing your programs? Because, and I'll give you a quick example from a state I worked in where they used to do RFPs and as you all do, and they brought in the RFP and they rated it according to the scores. I did that in Massachusetts too. That's the way you do it in the state. You don't allow anybody community in because you're gonna mess up the process and it'll be some illegal thing that happens horribly. Um, they were able to flip that on its heels and include community people because the people were gonna serve the community in the review process who weren't applying for the grant and they added an interview. And the people they would have picked based on the numeric scores were not the people they pick once they factored in the interview by going to the community and asking the voice of the people who are in that community. And so it, you, equity isn't something you do fast. So maybe you have a two year plan to get to 10 communities versus getting to them in the next six months. But speed is a, a white supremacy principle. It's not one that allows you to have conversation and voice. I keep forgetting I'm on video, but you know, conversation and voice and intentionality and feedback loop. And people aren't gonna tell you the whole story the first time you go out. So don't go out if you're not gonna go back. Um, you gotta go out with the intention of going back either with you know what you process with what they've said or to listen again more deeply. I'll give you one more example um, from some work I did in the state. Um, we went out and we listened. It was great turnout, had a local partner. And one of the gentlemen said, look, they don't hire people if you're from this city. They won't hire you if, you if you move into this city, you can get a job in three days. But if you live here, they look at your background and they will not hire you. And so the Department of Labor was there. This was a thing driven by young children, but the Department of Labor was one of our partners at the meeting. And she was like, shoot, well, I can control that. I give out all the training contracts. So I'll go back and say, every training contract must have a certain number of people who are from the town historically. 
And we said, okay, wait, let's go back and talk to them about, is that the right solution? We went back, she shared that solution. And the guy said, I got a whole envelope full of certificates. The training people let me in every training. I can't get the license because of something in my background or experience and they still won't hire me. So she could have made that change and it still would not have impacted. And there were two or three people because once people start telling a story, other people feed in about their lens on that story. So the feedback loop is important, small is important and tailored and targeted. Remember equity, I'm asking you pick a specific population and tailor it so it meets their needs. So you can't have a state strategy. I'm not asking for a universal strategy, I'm asking for a tailored strategy to meet the needs of a specific group of kids. That's who you have to be talking to. That's my advice. I really okay. like the idea of the relational um, aspect of things. I think you get more honest answers. And I think um, families are more empowered to speak up about their true wishes if we make this um, a smaller, more relational sort of um, setting. And I think the, the trusted... Um, community partnership has to be different in every community. I, I know in many of the rural communities around here, it doesn't work to have somebody from the county come in. It really needs to be somebody within that community to come in and, um, and find out what they want, first of all, what's gonna work for them. And it may be very different than what works even in another community 15 miles down the road. Yeah. Excellent points. Wow. Gr great conversation. Yeah, Kali. I just want to, I completely agree um, with what um, Sherry had shared. And I think um, it, it occurs to me that we have uh, people that are receiving funds, um, the equity fund recipients and some others that we might be able to tap into also to bring people to the table. So because they're serving diverse communities, we might want to get input from them or also have them do outreach. But it's that's just a slice and that's dealing with cultural communities because there's geographic communities and there are cultural communities, uh, ethnic communities as well. And they're not the same uh, per se. Uh, and so I, it seems that we should look at what current resources we have and relationships we have to do some outreach ahead of time to figure out what is the right small groups that we should be bringing together. Who are the key, um, I don't know, uh, who are the connectors? Who are the people that are gonna bring them? So yeah. um, those, those are my thoughts. Okay, thanks Kelly. And great distinction. There are cultural, there are racial, there are geographic, <laughs> lots of different communities to define. Um, well, we need to move on because we have our hub uh, panelists uh, with us and waiting. Uh, Sherry and Carrie, I want to thank both of you. Sherry, your comments and, and your experience um, is just invaluable. And um, I have a feeling we would love to invite you back again as we go down this road. And I know you and Carrie work together, obviously, all the time. So we'll rely on Carrie to keep pulling in your um, information and, and guidance. But thank you so much for making time for this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a good evening. Thanks, you too, Bye -bye. Sherry. Bye-bye. So Carrie, thank you so much. Um, obviously there's gonna be a lot to follow up from this and we'll work together in the weeks ahead and figure out how to bring this back to the council in April. That sounds great. Yeah, and council members, I'll be in touch with each of you as Carrie and I kind of hopefully put some options together so we can start bouncing some ideas off of um, each other and hopefully- and we'll and I'll send Remy the slides to get out to everyone so you can look at the three nas different national databases and then our compilation slide that kind of added them up and then said, what were the 10? We often with states then take that data and then get input from people in the state for context, for program data about where are their services, not services. And that might shape like what a list might look like for the council. Okay, great.
Thank you, Carrie, and thanks for setting that conversation up. All right, so council members, we will move on to our next agenda item. As you know, this is one we've also been talking about and, and wanting to initiate since our retreat, actually in October, but even before that. And that is to uh, start talking about early learning hubs. And we mentioned them at every council meeting. We've just never had a real focused time to hear from some hub representatives. So that is what we have um, in front of us. And as we head into this, um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Joan. And Joan, you might pop on to your real video. Um, and thank Joan for her leadership over the last two years, three years, two, two years. Um, in which she has really provided the leadership to do provide community engagement. We now have a new theory of change. Um, we have a report out about hubs and CCR and ours. Um, I can't imagine the number of hours and weekends that you've spent pulling all of these wonderful documents together for us, Joan. But you are leaving a great path behind you and a path for us to follow in the future. So thank you very much as you head back to the Midwest. Thank you very much. It's been my honor. And I'm so happy that I get to listen to these folks today. It's putting a really great bow on the whole experience. So thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks, Joan. So now um, we're, we have four panelists, as you know, from the agenda. And I was able to speak with uh, both Miguel and um, why does it say Jose? Luis. 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 <laughs> Jose. I, I thought it was Luis. <laughs> I was looking at your name. Um, yes, or Monday, I think, to talk about this panel. Um, and then Kelly and Renee as uh, hub directors. So if each of you four panelists would just do a really brief introduction. You know, your name and what hub you're with, where your hub's located, what, whatever. Um, then we'll go into the two questions that we've asked you to talk briefly about. Uh, council members, just so you know, we have an hour for this conversation. We have two questions, four panelists and eight council members, seven. <clears throat> no. but just know we're all gonna have to choose our words wisely, I guess, is what I'm saying, but it should be a robust conversation. And let me just ask Luis if you would uh, begin by introducing yourself. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Luis Nava. Uh, I'm living in Aloha, Washington County, and I'm part of the Early Learning Washington County. Great. And tell us about the parent advisory committees, if you would. Luis. Oh, also, uh, I'm part of the uh, advisory council, uh, the parents advisory council for uh, the early learning uh, Washington County, as well as different uh, parent advisory councils in uh, the Hillsborough School District, different schools, elementary, middle and high school. But also I'm part of the advisory board for the provost, uh, the extension services provost at Oregon State University. <clears throat> Awesome. And you have on duck colors, but I won't ask you how that happened. <laughs> oh, my, my, my daughter is in you. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. That's good to cover all the bases. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. Um, Miguel, will you introduce yourself? Yes. Um, hello, my name is Miguel, Miguel Angel Barrios Linares. Uh, I've been here in Oregon since 2000. And I feel proud of myself to be called an Oregonian. And I've been living in Beaverton since then. And a little bit of my background is that uh, I started working in the early childhood education field on 2005 when my wife and I, we got pregnant with our second child and then decided to, to become childcare providers. But it was until 2014 that I went back to get my my. GED, my general education certificate on 2014, that opens a door for me to access a, a credential from the, uh, 
for CDA, what is um, Child, Childhood Development Associates from the Washington Council for, prof for, for Professional Recognition from Washington, DC. And that opens another, another door. Uh, so uh, with my CDA, I, got, I was able to get into the uh, college education. So I, I signed up for the Portland Community College uh, Early Childhood Education uh, Associate's degree. And I earned my degree on 2020, right at the pandemic when everything starts. I earned my, my degree on, on Associates of Applied Science and Early Childhood Education and Family Studies. That's a little bit of my background, but I've been in the community um, with many friends all over the place. And I've been involved with, with the hub for about six years on the road. So, awesome. yeah, so I am part of the, the Washington County Early Learning Hub. Great, thank you, Miguel, very thank much. You. And now we have two hub directors with us. Uh, Kelly, will you introduce yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Poe. I'm with the Eastern Oregon Early Learning Hub, which serves Baker, Malheur, and Wallowa counties. Um, we often call it the East Coast of Oregon. And um, I am calling in from Vail. Vail, Oregon. Vail, Oregon. Glad to be here. Got it. Well, thank you for calling in, Kelly. And Renee down in Peter's territory. Good afternoon. Uh, Renee Brandon, director of the Southern Oregon Early Learning Hub. We serve Jackson and Josephine counties. <clears throat> and we are one of the large hubs in terms of um, child population. We have about 17,000 children under the age of six. And with our recent data analysis that we did with our regional sector plan, we identified that about 60% of the families with children under age six are at or below 200% of federal poverty level. Just to give you a little bit of a, a background on our, our family. Wow, thank you, Renee. So let's turn, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie and she's going to facilitate um, this panel for us. So Carrie, back to you. Thank you. I'm basically going to be the timekeeper. What our plan is, is to take each of our two questions one at a time and that we would let each of the four panelists um, make their comments and reflections on that question. They might build on each other's comments. And then council members, we would want to engage with you for the remaining amount of time in conversation back and forth and an opportunity to off offer questions. And then we would move on to the second question and repeat it. So our first uh, question uh, right now is in the past year, what is one example of your hub's point of pride for community system building? And Louise, we thought we would go start with you and then go to Miguel and then um, we'll go with Kelly and Renee if that sounds good to all of you. Okay, sounds good. So in the last year, um, as you know, you know, it was a very challenging year uh, because we usually meet in person and we have to do it through Zoom that at the end uh, works perfectly because, you know, we now we are adjust this new way to communicate and, and it's very proactive. But um, one of the most important uh, components uh, was uh, to define uh, the priority groups that we have in our county, you know, uh, and, and how to allocate uh, more funding to those areas specifically, like for example, the Latino community, but also in the area of Beaverton, we have uh, immigrants from the East um, and uh, West area of um, uh, Iraq, Iran, and all those areas, but also we have indigenous, uh, indigenous communities in the area. So we work, as a hub just to try to identify those communities, their needs, and how to allocate those uh, resources for them just because of these uh, new challenges. Uh, then uh, also uh, we create a permanent collections in the library for the uh, providers to take out to work in their uh, uh, daycare center. Also, um, Again, uh, the indigenous communities, it was very challenging for them because 
uh, we identify them as a, Hispanics, but they don't speak Spanish. They have they speak several different languages, uh, so it was very difficult to get to them, especially for providing them the support for uh, the COVID relief, you know, the mask, the sanitizer, and all those equipments. Also, um, we work uh, with churches and schools uh, coordinating uh, the uh, food, box, uh, food boxes and masks and sanitizer. And we also uh, help with the distribution. So, you know, based on these challenges, uh, we did very good and, and we are very proud of that. Great, thank you, Luis. Miguel, do you want to build on his reflections and your one example? Um, yeah, one of the examples to bring those community together is uh, one of the challenges that he he was mentioned is we're facing the accessibility. So for us, the importance of having the uh, access to the preschool promise classrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, it was not easy for these families. So in order to make it easy, uh, they have come, come up with an idea of uh, what is called a coordinated enrollment. That means um, it benefits uh, for, because it can help, because it can be online, it can be done on paper, but also we have a place for, for uh, drop boxes, blue drop boxes that are in four different locations in, in the Washington County. They are, they are installed in Hillsborough and Tiger, Cornelius and Beaverton. So there is that accessibility, accessibility to, to drop in those, those papers. Um, also the benefit to have this uh, coordinated enrollment is because it was support, it is supported on many platforms. Mm -hmm. That means uh, it doesn't matter if you if the parents have a tablet or cell phone or an actual computer, uh, they can access through it and, uh, the, and avoid the duplicity of, of the information. That what, that's the benefit of having this coordinated enrollment. Um, and it's, it simplifies because uh, before it was many, many steps to get enrollment, this, this kind of enrolling process, it makes it much easier for the parents to understand. So it's not as elaborated, not so complicated, so pretty easy for the parents. And that's that's a very, very good part because the access is not not easy in considering that or that English is not main language. Mm -hmm. So that's that's another another part. Uh, and that's, that's the goal to provide this access to many, to a diverse cultural uh, people. And, and these classrooms are, are, are serving uh, families for a variety of, of bilingual, multilingual or monolingual families, uh, but in, they are distributed be, in between be 29 uh, preschool promise programs. Yes. And okay. in some of the spoken language, there are uh, Vietnamese, Arabic, Korean, and Spanish, just to mention some of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was impressed on, on, my, on my classroom at the Parent Community College when we count how many, how many, just an exercise, how many language was there in the classroom, we come up like about 30 different languages because just for example, if we count on between many of us, we may come up with about 10 different languages here in this, in this forum, in this panel. And that multiplies when we're talking about families in our community. Am I on time? Yeah, you're okay. that's perfect. Thank, Thank you, Miguel. <laughs> Kelly, you want to share your example from Eastern Oregon? <laughs> sure. And I, I, I love the positivity of this question. Um, so, I, you know, the Eastern Oregon Early Learning Hub is, you know, from, from Washington to Nevada, the, the entire um, length of the state. And I want to talk about our governance board. So our, our governance board is made up of five appointed people from each county representing the different sectors. 
And since the early care and education sector planning in 2019, the board has really changed. So the process was pivotal for us. The entire board met in Baker City with Denise Swanson and Heidi McGowan for a full day of work. So in our, um, in our region, we use a, a term that we learned through our equity workshops called gracious space. Gracious space is an environment where diverse perspectives can be shared and people are committed to listening and learning in public. So the board shared local insights to the data. We had really challenging conversations and, and authentic learning about the needs and, and challenges and successes of local parents caring for their children. In Wallowa County, the data told us that the poverty rate isn't as high as it is in other places in Oregon, but the data didn't tell us and the board members did tell us about the disparities between the influx of retired people with wealth and high levels of education. So our struggling families are hidden in the data, but our board was able to advocate for their needs. In Baker County, there's been a collective impact effort with a common agenda to develop an early learning center and it's well represented on our hub board. In Malheur County, the board was able to bring local data on our refugees that are resettling in Ontario through the members who were instrumental in the development of a welcome center there. So data wasn't available through the census, but when we asked the welcome center director, she listed each family with their child and their country of origin. And based on this information, our board was able to identify their challenges. So the board is leading changes in the region through advocacy for programs and services needed by local families. Our preschool promise sites are thriving. They transition to direct contracting with support from hub staff who transitioned over to our new CCRNR. The new Eastern Oregon CCRNR is also thriving. The early learning hub advocated for local people in each community that are culturally and linguistically equipped and has consistently supported professional development to early care and education professionals. So we continue to collaborate on high quality professional development events throughout the region. The board doesn't have any governance over the CCRNR, but is committed to staying engaged in a collaborative and supportive role. Likewise, the Early Learning Hub Board is not the OPEC hub, and um, we still stay engaged in a collaborative and supportive role for our OPEC hub too. So through collaborative relationships between coordinated enrollment, OPEC and CCRNR, the hub is creating a, a family-centered multicultural space in Ontario and in Baker City where families will meet for coordinated enrollment, for focus groups and other family engagement events. Our new Ontario facility is a shared space with the Welcome Center for Refugees and ERCO who will be providing healthy families home visiting in Malheur and Baker counties. And this is all because the Early Learning Hub was in the position to facilitate the collaboration as the term hub implies. Thank you, Kelly, for those reflections. Renee, would you like to build on it from your community's um, perspective? Yes, I wanted to um, share a little bit about our work with Race of Oregon um, and how we've been using it for our strategic planning. Um, I, I've shared this on hub calls with ELD before, but Race of Oregon has really been a game changer for the early learning hubs in engaging our cross-sector partners. I feel like it was the, the missing tool needed for strategic planning. Um, we have found that um, the various sector partners, they can see themselves in the Race of Oregon plan, and it makes the conversation about regional systems work um, much clearer for them um, than before we had that document. And the way that we are using it, we are going, we're, we're um, utilizing our agency advisory council, which is our largest cross-sector body of partners. And we're going through each objective and each strategy. And we're asking, what is Southern Oregon currently doing um, that is supportive of this strategy? And then we're also asking, what else can or should we be doing that would help elevate this strategy in our region? Um, and then we are prioritizing 
um, our answers, knowing that we can't, you know, be a mile wide and an inch deep, we really have to do some prioritization. Um, and then once we have our priorities, we are assigning the, the committee that will be the accountability partner um, to ensure that that um, elevated uh, strategy continues to move forward. And then we are reporting back to our agency advisory council and our governance council on the progress. COVID slowed us down a little bit on that strategic planning work, but we're back at it now. I wanted to share um, a couple of examples of how we've started to implement that. So as we've been going through the Raise Up Oregon plan, we identified that we needed um, an ECE workforce committee to be able to carry forward that big body of work. And so the Early Learning Hub um, convened a subcommittee uh, addressed specifically for the ECE workforce. And I listed some of the partners here to make sure that I captured them all. We have several community-based early learning programs, Head Start, Migrant Head Start, our early intervention programs, our child care resource and referral, child care licensing, Southern Oregon Success, Rogue Community Colleges ECE program, Medford and Grants Pass City Government, uh, our regional workforce board, and a very dynamic, dynamic parent representative who has a son who experiences a disability. And so that's the body that is carrying that work forward. Um, when COVID hit, our committee was brand new and we um, coordinated the effort to get information out to employers on what was happening with childcare. Uh, they wanted to know if their employees qualified as essential workers, how would they find that information out? How could they direct their employees to the correct information? Uh, we pushed out information about employment-related daycare, ERDC subsidy, um, promoting that there was a, um, um, a pause on the copay and that there was an expanded eligibility parameter for families. So that was some of the initial emergency child care support that we did. Some of our ongoing work, we've identified that um, Increasing the early learning workforce is um, a critical need across the state and certainly in our region as well. And so there are really two groups um, that are needed. One are those entry level workers and the other are the, the high quality teachers. And so right now we're focusing on the entry level workers. We have a partnership with um, an alternative high school in one of our larger cities and with a community-based community -based organization that helps youth with employment. And so we are launching a pilot that is a paid internship to get students into early learning classrooms and exposure to the early care and education field. And this pilot project is inclusive of high school students experiencing disability as well. Uh, we just launched it last month. We have six or seven early learning programs that have agreed to be sites. Each student will have an employment coach that will come with them on site to ensure that they're being uh, feeling supported and feeling successful. We're offering training so that by the time they graduate, they have the CPR first aid, they have the recognizing reporting child abuse neglect, they have a criminal background checked if they're 18 or older and they're ready to enter the workforce. Uh, we also have our workforce partner, workforce board partner who is agreeing to continue to fund that pilot going forward so that it wouldn't just be early learning hub funds, you know, sustaining this project. Super excited about that. Um, and then, you know, the bigger issue is uh, quality teachers. And that is a bigger issue that I know will uh, continue to have a statewide conversation. We're having local conversations to gather data, uh, but we know that that isn't a, a solution that's gonna be happening locally for us. But that's one example of the strategic planning and the committee that's really driving the work forward. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate everyone's comments. I think you, we started to hear across all of you really strong family engagement and family-centered work, really centering the work around culture and multiple languages and recognizing and finding out about the families in your community. We heard uh, the connection to cross-sector partners and community that are helping develop the workforce. Um, and also how does that tie to our, our big lofty goals and raise up Oregon. So I think this is the time for Council members, for you to ask clarifying questions, um, offer your perspective. Many of you work with your hubs closely to have an exchange around the, the kinds of examples we're hearing about that are building toward uh, stronger local community systems. Yeah. 
Yeah, th first of all, I just want to thank all four of you. That was just so rich and so compelling. And your dedication to these issues is so impressive and it gives hope to all of the rest of us. So thank you for your leadership. Um, it's amazing. I'm, I, I, my question is about the workforce, uh, about workforce development in the early childhood arena. Um, how do we develop a workforce that can meet the needs of your specific communities? Um, Miguel, I just am so impressed that you went back to college, went back to get an associate's degree in early child development. How can we do, what more can we do to be developing this kind of a workforce and, and how do we think about it? Well, um, for me, it was a personal, um, I could want to say respectfully a smack in the face when one of the parents say, uh, they think I was making huge amounts of money unjustified and they are wrong. The concept is completely wrong because they saw what, what the, imburse, the disimbursement from the state through the ERDC program was, and they assuming they multiply that for so many kids and they start making ideas. And he told me, oh, I may be in the wrong, at the wrong profession. And that hits me and in, in, in my heart mainly. And it wants me to, to be a, not just a um, babysitter, but an actual professional in the childhood, early childhood education. That motivation, it was personal. Um, but I see that my other college mates in, in my classroom, um, the motivation was the love for children. That's what mo really motivates us. For me, um, as a teacher, I like to be around them. I, I like to see the joy on their faces when we learn something new or when they discover uh, a warm that we just pick up from the ground. And it, 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 it's a light that came from inside. So, and the, all those people in my college, we are talking about how much we enjoy working with children. Um, it will be hard to tell you how can we motivate more kids to get into the into the profession. Um, it is tough because just for me it was tough. People imagine um, women working in this field only. So when they see a, a male like me, um, for me, it takes double or triple to earn the, the trust of moms, mainly. And, and, and it's just justify or not, but it is reality. And for me, I've been working uh, hard. So I need to, to build for myself the to, with the tools uh, to have the response to, to those families but not just on, on verbal, but my actions, my teaching, my, my passion for, for, for engaging with those kids and, and discover new, new, new ideas. And that's why I involved also in the hub because they are focused on the, on the whole child and the whole child brings a family along. It's not just one child. And I hope our society can find this, um, issue like we're not just seeing the things separate but we we need to see the whole family as a as a one thing that because if uh, if the bro the older brother or the younger brother is not feeling well uh, kids won't be well in classroom so our main objective for me is my passion to teach and and have them be ready for kindergarten when they get ready for kindergarten. No, yes, on an ABC issues, but also the the confident to go and learn new things, to explore themselves, to learn by themselves, and communicate. Communicate. Um, I'm proud to teach them in Spanish. Believe mm -hmm. that will later uh, they build the they will build later the English. When they get to regular school. So I focus a lot in Spanish teaching. 
Thanks, Miguel. Would any of the other panelists like to reflect Am on- Am I okay? Yeah. Yeah, you're definitely, you're great. Um, would any of the I other thought, panelists- I was breaking, sorry. Oh, you're breaking up. <laughs> uh, would any of the other panelists like to add to Miguel's comments about workforce? Yes, uh, Luis Nava. Um, uh, the same to Miguel, I went back to college uh, to get my degree in early learning education. I'm taking classes right now in Monkhood Community College, even though I'm living in Washington County and I have PCC very close. But for me, Monkhood Community College give me more opportunities to work and take my classes than PCC. So, you know, that's one point. The other point that I want us, uh, 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 to talk about is about um, how we can coordinate between the universities and the college about the curriculum. Because if I take some classes in Monroe Community College, PCC doesn't have the same alignment. So, I'm, and, and as a PCC employee, I got the opportunity to take uh, free tuition for classes. But if I want to later on get my uh, BA, it's going to be something difficult. So on the other hand, uh, we are having problems because of the compensation factor. You know, uh, preschool uh, professionals or preschool providers, the amount of money that they are receiving is very, very minimum that students doesn't want to go into the field, even though they love it, you know? And, and for example, in Monkhood Community College, they got several places that we can practice, uh, but they are paying only $12.50. So it's, it's, it's a very challenging uh, in, in, in that sense. Thanks, Louise. Um, other reflections from council members about what you heard um, across the panelists? Hey, I don't have a reflection, but I think that Renee wanted to add to that workforce question as well. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, when Miguel was speaking, it reminded me of the documentary, No Small Matter. And if, if any council members haven't yet had the opportunity to view it, please do and share. Um, we shouldn't have to choose between teachers who love children and teachers that want to pay their bills. Um, and that really is the, the, the challenge that our workforce is um, faced with right now. And then Louise's comment um, on having an education system that really supports your needs is so critical. And, We've had some success in Southern Oregon um, in having cohorts of early learning um, providers who may already be in the field and they may be working. Um, and so the, the classes are offered at a, at a reasonable pace for a working professional and all of the cost is subsidized. And so they have the opportunity to earn a one-year certificate that is stackable to a two-year degree that is stackable to that four-year degree. And so with, with our very strong partnership between the Early Learning Hub, our Child Care Resource and Referral, and our local community college, we've been able to build that system that is really successful. And we've been able to fund it to some degree, but it's not fully sustainable. And not everyone can have access. There are limitations to how many we can serve. And so, you know, sustainability is always the issue if we truly want to keep those in the field um, earning that. That education that they. So, quick follow up question, Renee Is the workforce task force that you've put together or your committee trying to address the compensation issue at all? You know, that's something that we have wrestled with locally. Um, what, what we're hearing from the, the members of the committee, some of them are um, offer Head Start programs, some of them preschool promise programs. And you know, they're, they're pointing out the pay parity issues between the teachers that are in a preschool promise classroom and the teachers that are in a non-preschool promise classroom doing the same work in classrooms right next to each other. Right. That, we don't feel like we have a regional solution for that, that that's, that's a bigger system level you know, issue. We do have workforce board partners that are, that are interested in exploring um, 
you know, the, the model, I guess, um, and how, how we might move closer to a um, kindergarten teacher compensation and what, what the barriers are to getting us there. Um, knowing that there are different, you know, uh, streams of funding that that are not the same as the K-12 system. So we don't have a solution for compensation, but we know that that pay and benefits are what keeps quality teachers in the classroom so they can pay their bills. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Renee. And I see, Kelly, you've added your comments about your work to work on workforce in your region where you found creative places to grow the workforce and your, your community college partners um, as well. So why don't we start with you for the second question, which is what are your ideas about the future opportunities, needs and barriers that need to be addressed so early learning hubs are able to realize a more aligned, coordinated and family centered regional system. If you'd like to kick us off and then Louise, I'll go to you a second. Thank you, Carrie. Well, when I thought about the opportunity that we need to address to realize a more aligned, coordinated and family-centered regional system, I had to ask, what are we hubbing? Who are we bringing together and how and why? We've had a whole lot of conversations about our names. You know, what is a hub? I believe hubs can be the local liaison between parents and business, social services, K-12 education, healthcare, faith community and other community organizations. And I've seen other hubs who are so successful in convening their early care and education sector. In Eastern Oregon, we've had more success in convening our other sectors. But looking back over the past seven years, I know that we're stronger for the lessons that we learned and we're better because of the relationships that were formed. It wasn't easy and it wasn't a straight road. We started with a disconnected region that spans over 16,000 square miles. Local people were hesitant to move away from the old Commission on Children and Families focus on all children. Even back in those days though, we were pretty good at partnering in our local counties. So we used a collective impact to design our hub and it made sense to most of our partners. We had a shared vision that all children and their families would be included. The challenge of the early learning system was, a, was the narrow focus on early childhood. The theory of change process was evolving in our work all the way back from the beginning. And I can see parts of each element in our past in parts and pieces, but not systemically. From collaborative action to system change to early outcomes and finally to the ultimate impact of racial and ethnic disparities as children meet developmental milestones. A critical piece of our work was described, and I love this. I, um, we have it hanging on our wall here in our office, and I can't pronounce um, this woman's last name, but you might know her by her first name. Um, she was a tr an early childhood advocate back in the 80s named Dosha. Um, her last name is, I'm sorry, with a Z. Uh, she said, our challenge is not to prepare children for school, but to prepare schools for children. And, and I'd like to also add that we're preparing our communities too. So we officially changed our original name of the Eastern Oregon Community-Based Services Hub to the Eastern Oregon Early Learning Hub to indicate our commitment to early childhood. Having a cross-sector advocates in each community is now our key to success in addressing our common agenda, which is families are supported as children's first teachers. Families have equitable access to services and opportunities while programs, policies, practices, and investments are aligned. We're now using research and science to guide our investments and our collaborations. As we act as a hub in the early learning system, we can focus on problem solving and action. In collaboration with the early learning division, we need to learn through rapid feedback and continuous improvement as the theory of change demonstrates. Looking to the future, I believe hubs need to be clear on what they are the hub of. Like I mentioned earlier, we're evolving in a positive direction. Relationships take time and time allows us to see the progress and momentum that's growing. My region wasn't ready for the theory of action seven years ago, but we're ready now. I couldn't feel more positive about the direction we're moving and the ability to connect with parents, 
and to work collaboratively with our child care resource and referral, with our Oregon Parent Education Collaborative, and our Head Start programs. That's my thoughts. Thank you, Kelly. Louise, we also asked you, like, as you think about your hub, what are the opportunities or needs? What, you, what would you like to share? Okay, uh, retaking the theory of change, uh, as you know, we, the parents, uh, we provide the input. We are the thermometer, the, you know, the thermometer, the community thermometer. So if the relationship with the parents are strong, you are gonna have more input, more reliable resources and support. So that's the key element. But the question is how we can be more proactive and not just saying, parents, you are welcome. Or parents, this is your hub. This is your, is, is what happened in my hub. You know, um, I've been involved with the hub since the beginning and I see all the changes and we are very lucky to have a, a, the amount of partners, the stakeholders that we have and the, and the way that we work is amazing. But also I want to emphasize in our hub, uh, we have one um, parent advisory council, but we divided them in two, east side of the county and west side of the county and why? because we have different population, but also for geographical purpose, it's more easy to get into the meetings. Mm -hmm. But what I want to see is that in every a preschool set, also motivate the parent engagement and participation. So if we can create a more strong uh, group of a small parent, you know, groups, and then work together, we can do best for our county. But also what I want to, to, to point on this is the funding purposes, because for this to may happen, we need somebody else in a full-time position to take and, and, and organize all these different groups and provide them the necessary tools to grow and develop. Like we do, for example, in our county, we prepare workshops, not only for what we do or for the children, we provide workshop, leadership workshop for the parents. So in, in order to grow, but also uh, what I want to talk is about um, a, Everybody says that we, the parents, are the first teachers. But until I start studying for early childhood development, and I learn all these new you know, ideas and theories, parents doesn't know anything of that. Parents also didn't know exactly what are the curriculum or what the schools are doing or the pre-schools are doing. If we start thinking and also giving more information to the parents about the system, how we provide the system, but also the different milestones in the, in the age of developing of the children, we are gonna have more support from the parents, more help from them. Uh, the impact, we already are seeing the impact. How, in the beginning, when we start the Parent Advisory Council, and with the years, we start growing a sense of leadership, but also remember these parents have children in middle school, elementary, high schools. So later on, those parents start forming parent advisory councils in different schools. So that's the impact that we provide, you know, uh, to get that sense of leadership, but also keep with the, with the education. Uh, I remember when my kids were in, in, in a school, they don't like me to go to the school, you know? But in the parents, they, they, they feel stuck about that. But since they are practicing at this level, they, they learn, they encourage, 
and and they are working amazingly in the uh, preschool. Or, I'm sorry, in uh, um, uh, elementary, middle school, in high school. And another thing that I want to I want to 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 mention is that um, uh, the support that we need um, is it has to be meaningful just know you know saying that you are the first educators uh we want you because we care about you but if we don't see it as parents if we don't see really that uh, uh, um, that impact uh we get distressed and and, and disappear Thank you, Louise, for those reflections. It's really helpful to think about that. And Miguel, I was wondering if you wanted to build on anything or contribute um, additional opportunities or needs. And you're on mute, I think. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, what I'd like to build is more in what I've been worrying me on this pandemic about my children and their families is about the access to mental health. Mm. Uh, that, that's a real issue that is impacting our, our society as a whole thing, uh, especially the, the little children. Um, and when these families finally get access to mental health, probably through agencies like LifeWorks, um, you find another obstacle that is the language. The services are provided in English and that represents an obstacle right away, right away. So we need to, to work together with whoever we need to work in and build a stronger mental health system that works for the families and their children. Um, the personnel is limited and it's probably because maybe there is not enough pay and it's hard to retain them. Uh, if, for example, for a program, for a preschool promise program, I think it will be very hard for those programs to provide the service to the families they serve in of mental health because, it, because of the budget, it will, it will be make it almost impossible to, to pay one, one person to come and give uh, mental health support to the families, even if it's in group, which cannot be right now, it have to be through Zoom, but um, it, it, it's almost impossible. I don't think it's equal it fit into any, 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 any program budget. So that was before our time goes, of, uh, we want, I would like to mention that part of the mental health. It's a, it's a real issue and we need to focus on, on that. Thank you so much for raising that, Miguel. It's definitely been on the radar of the council, but hearing your context about it is really important to all of us. Thank um, you. Uh, Renee, do you wanna close out with your comments and then we'll open it up to all council members? Yes, thank you. Um, my um, identified needs are probably a little more practical <laughs> than some of the, the other suggestions. Um, one, one need that I think the hubs um, would benefit from is uh, retooling the funding formula for hubs. I'm one of the larger hubs um, and the funding formula doesn't impact me, but it does impact many of my um, fellow hub leaders. Um, who may have a smaller child population, which is currently how um, the funding formula is driven, when really um, that isn't, doesn't take into account the large geographic area that, that Kelly pointed out at the, at the beginning of, of the call. Um, so retooling that, and I know that's already a conversation, but I think it's a really important one for hubs to be able to truly serve their communities and have the infrastructure to do that. Um, Having a central place for all reporting and data collection at the early learning division is really critical. Right now, um, depending on the program, it might come in an Excel sheet to the ELD, it might be in a smart sheet, 
So there isn't a central way that data is collected and disseminated. And it, it creates a lot of extra work on everyone's part. And it also doesn't really allow us to be able to data mine easily and to tell the stories of our communities, our families, and the impact of, of the early learning hubs in community. Um, really utilizing the hubs ECE sector plan um, when making investments is critical. For example, the first year of coordinated enrollment needed to roll up pretty rapidly due to you know, some of the impacts of COVID slowing down that process. And so we are using a random lottery um, when really the best investment would be using the data from those sector plans that have identified the priority populations of those families that are already not accessing, don't, that don't have access to early learning right now prior to kindergarten. And then my last one was just to be mindful of good intentions as we are throwing up new ideas. And I use the, um, the developmental screening tool that was a CCO incentive metric came to mind. It really did increase the utilization of screening and early learning and healthcare programs, but it did not factor in the impact it caused to our early intervention programs that then received those referrals. They cannot have waiting lists. And it created a real system bottleneck that we didn't have a response to. There wasn't a balance of funding on the service side that the screening side created. Mm -hmm. and, and so just as we're creating um, new strategies in the future to make sure we run it all the way down the line so that we don't unintentionally harm a partner or create a frustrating experience for, for a family. Thank you, Renee. I would like to open it up. We have about 10 minutes left for this part of the agenda. So council members, feel free to ask questions or add your own reflections to the conversation. Is it okay if I go, Sue? <laughs> okay. I'm curious about, I was just glancing over um, the state's early learning hubs website Tell me about some stories of how you partnered with the private sector that you thought was really helpful in your work. Maybe not so helpful. <laughs> long, a long pause for a reason. Yeah. So when you say private sector, are you talking about businesses specifically? Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the the arrows here on your site of, of how you integrate. And, and I've certainly worked with the Central Oregon. So I work for a chamber and I, I work with our Central Oregon hub. And, and I'm just curious what you've done around the state that you thought that was really useful in furthering your goal with um, businesses in your area. I'd like to learn what's going on out there. Well, I think you're probably learning that we're not that different from you. It's, it's always been a challenge and we've been fairly successful in having a business person represented on our hub board. Usually that business person is someone who's already serving, you know, on several other boards, such as a school board or um, a relief nursery board or something like that. So they understand this, this system work, but to bring someone in who's new to the system is more challenging. In Wallawa County, we have a new chamber director moving um, back home to Wallawa County. I think she was raised there. So she's moving back. And even before she got all the way unpacked, we had her um, join our meeting and, and talked about the need for um, bringing businesses to the table. And we had a really great conversation. And we had the conversation in, in all three counties at our local Cradle to Career Partnership meetings. So we're asking the same question, Katie. Um, you can look at the Early Learning Center in Baker City. And I think that there's other early learning centers around the state that have had some um, positive support from businesses. We have some, um, we had a, a packing shed in Nyssa that worked with us closely over the period of uh, you know, two or three months trying to get an early childhood center or, or any kind of child care for their employees and it failed. So um, that's not a success story, but it is a story of saying how hard it is. And we just couldn't get childcare in an industrial zone. So 
it, we, we just keep learning. And, and like I said, our, our path has been really crooked and bumpy and, but we've developed a lot of relationships. So now at least the packing sheds in NISA know about the early learning hub. They know about Dolly Parton Imagination Library. They know about home visiting. There's a whole lot of things that they know about now, just because we, we went down a path of trying to figure out um, the child care crisis in NISA. So a lot of little stories and not a lot of success, but we're, we're farther down the road than we were five years ago. Maybe someone has a better story. <laughs> Renee, is there any good story out of Southern Oregon or Peter? I, I'm sorry to report that we, we don't have any uh, um, really stunning stories with business. What I can say is that COVID did um, create an opportunity. Businesses in our region became aware that childcare was an issue um, for the first time. And so it's really been our workforce partner. We have um, the governor's regional solutions office representative that has uh, episodically joined our, our workforce meetings. Um, the uh, several staff from our regional workforce board are interested in solving the childcare issues for the employers. So we've really been working with those work for, workforce partners as a liaison versus directly working, engaging with private sector business. Um, it, it is a tough, tough um, nut to crack. I don't have any, any great stories to share. I know that it's important. Um, what I'm hopeful for is that this initial COVID will continue to um, create those conversations beyond just a childcare need and really um, engage our, our business community in a, in a deeper way. Hey, can I add, you know, because we have a regional solutions person in Eastern Oregon who has contacted us about some specific childcare needs and some business opportunities and worked with us on the NISA project as well. I think it's interesting that people from the governor's office are contacting the early learning hub to talk about solutions for childcare. Not sure where that goes to, but it sounds interesting and good. You know, I think just a quick note, looking at future council meetings, I know enough people on the council to know this is a highly um, top of the mind topic for I think every one of us around the state. So I think we'd be wise to ask our staff to pull together some information about what are some business options that are being investigated. Katie certainly has examples of ones that have not worked. So um, I know philanthropy is looking at some shared service opportunities and I, I think it'd be something that the council would be really interested in just doing more of a deep dive on. So let's put that in as a placeholder. I know Anne's had issues down in Roseburg as well. So it's pretty universal. Uh, can I add something? Uh, yes, the COVID brings an opportunity to, you know, to, to see the hub in a different way. And, and to you know get the industry, the private industry, just to look what's going on there. So before COVID, we developed a STEM kit uh, that we distribute those through the county. And, um, and now we got the second one and there is some interest in some uh, members of Intel to get you know, to help us in this idea to, pro to create more kids, more sets. So that's the beginning of a relationship with that industry. But also in my involvement with the uh, Hillsborough School District Parent Involvement uh, uh, Council, uh, I got the opportunity to meet uh, owners of different uh, grocery stores that provide food for uh, backpacks for elementary students. So that's something that I'm thinking right now and start looking for those you know, partnerships in, in order to start creating those backpacks also for the early learning, for the preschoolers. 
Awesome. We have a couple more minutes. Sue, Sorry. did you have a reflection? No, obviously this has been a very informative conversation and I I think I want to thank all four of our presenters for the different perspectives, different geographic locations, um, for um, our parents to provide their uh, perspective on what the hubs have done, and certainly where the hubs need or hope to be going in the future. And I don't know if any of the presenters have any kind of final, this is something that we really need done yesterday. Just a really quick shot. Yes. I got one. Okay. Uh, in, everything is family center, you know, and what is bugging me for the last three or four years is about this double standard that exists in between the registered providers and the non-registered providers. You know, we are talking about uh, bringing the, our kids a healthy and safe environment to, to, to study and grow. That's happening in a register uh, uh, centers or, or providers. But on the other hand, in the other ones, in the non-registered providers, they don't have background checks. We don't know anything about what kind of food they provide to the children, but also they are not educated. You know, they, they, they just like a babysitting. And it's a huge, huge amount of our children that are in that situation. So we need to see, I would love to see the state uh, allocating some funding to subsidize some kind of training for these no register providers for the basic things but the background check is very important. I have a feeling there are several people, including our fearless leader, Director Calderon, who will second what you just said, Luis. Can I add just a word, Sue, to, yeah. to what Luis is saying? I really agree. And I think it's really important that the council helps us in local communities um, uh, do the best we can for kids. Sometimes, and this is my own personal experience, sometimes when I work with the business community, they wanna find a way around the rules. Um, we don't wanna find a way around the rules. We wanna provide the very best possible um, experience for our children um, all the way through. I really like what Louise said and um, help us get there instead of, um, instead of around it. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, I think we need to wrap it up. Um, once again, thank you to um, all of our presenters. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you to Miguel and Luis for your longstanding involvement in the Washington Hub and other hubs and the parent advisory councils and um, you are great leaders among the parents, which uh, provides a great model for other people. Uh, and of course, Renee and Kelly, we appreciate your leadership among other hub directors as well. So lots to think about, reflect on and follow up on. Um, we now have a 10 minute break council members. So we will just sign off and do jumping jacks or whatever you do to stay awake. Um, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about legislation and have um, Dana Hepper from the Children's Institute join us. Um, and Cully will be presenting some information too from the Racial Justice Council. So we'll see you at uh, 3.25. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I said 3.5.
so it's hot up here. Is it okay for you? It's warm. Oops. Feel free to open the window if you like. It's Hello, welcome back. I think, are we back? Yes, we are. Okay. <clears throat> wow. What an informative two, <clears throat> two hours we've had so far. Um, <clears throat> we're now going to start talking about legislation and our legislative agenda, which we've obviously talked about at many former meetings. Um, <clears throat> we've invited Dana Hepper from the Children's Institute and who is also helping coordinate the Early Childhood Coalition to uh, join us today. And in your packet was a one pager representing um, priorities from the coalition. So Dana will be chatting with us and we'll have time for questions also with Dana. Um, Dana, thank you very much for yet another Zoom meeting on your calendar. <laughs> I know you have a few of them. Um, and then Kali is going to share some of the priorities which also were in our packet um, from the Racial Justice Council's um, Education Recovery Committee, which she is a member of. And you will see council members, as I'm, I'm sure you have reviewing the packet, there's a lot of alignment and crossover between our list of priorities um, and what we're going to be hearing from um, Dana and Kali about. So it's exciting to see where the um, alignment is. And as I say, we will have time for questions and, and conversations. So um, keep those in mind as we listen to Dana and Kali. So Dana, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Dana, I'm guessing most of you know, Dana is a probably one of the premier leaders in advocacy for early childhood in Oregon. So we are very fortunate for the work you're doing, Dana. Um, as well as for joining us today. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm Dana Hepper. I'm the Director of Policy and, Pro uh, Policy and Advocacy at the Children's Institute. Um, we are um, Oregon's birth through third grade child advocacy organization. Um, and we also have the joy and privilege of um, serving as the backbone organization for an early childhood coalition um, that um, this year has 29 organizations who have signed on to a shared set of, of priorities for the 2021 legislative session. And so that's the agenda that I'll be talking with you about today and that you received in your packet. Um, I wanna talk about three things. One is our process for setting those 2021 priorities, which um, was um, pretty different than it was leading up to the 2019 session um, and really focused on um, having our agenda priorities be more grounded in the priorities of parents and providers who've been most marginalized by our um, state systems. Two, I'll just share quickly what our priorities are. I know you've seen that one pager um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And then three, our advocacy strategy. Basically, how are we going to make sure that parents and providers have the opportunity to speak directly to decision makers and influence their decisions? So the process. Um, in 
In 2019, following the passage of the Student Success Act, the Early Childhood Coalition came together and said, okay, you know, what has been working about how we're working together and what do we need to shift? And there was clear consensus that one big shift that the coalition wanted to make was to center racial equity in our shared work. And this commitment, um, we had a team come together and craft a racial equity framework that serves as an internal guiding document um, our, and clarifies that our commitment um, to racial equity is grounded in our shared understanding that racism is built into all systems, including the early childhood system. And also our understanding that early childhood is a critical window in which to advance racial equity. Uh, in order to create a more equitable future for Oregon, we must not only address disproportionate impacts of COVID-19, but the pre-existing systemic inequities that are causing the current disparities. So we needed to then figure out how we would actually put this commitment into action. And we decided together to be guided first by the experiences of black and indigenous families, families of color and providers who've been historically excluded from policy and budget decisions. Um, and so to do that, we started building our legislative agenda in March of 2020. And we looked to our culturally specific providers and our, our provider partners who work most closely um, with families of color um, to have them share with the whole coalition what the priorities were um, that they were hearing from parents and providers in there um, that were uh, working with their organizations. Soon after our meeting, I think we met on the Tuesday um, in March before the Friday that Governor Brown closed schools. So our, all of our coalition partners got thrown into the um, work of COVID. You know, we had partners who were on coalition meetings while delivering food boxes. And, um, you know, I just would, partners who've been sucked into the three special sessions. I mean, I just say, would say every single partner has been dramatically impacted, um, but somehow, <laughs> we continue to hold this thread that we'd started last March and identified some bill concepts and sponsoring legislators um, and budget priorities. Um, we also developed some guiding questions that helped us assess whether ideas that were put forward had um, included uh, those most impacted by the decisions and the development of that proposal and whether the proposal itself was designed to impact disparities specifically by race and then secondarily by income, disability, et cetera. Um, in November, um, early childhood coalition partners were invited to submit uh, agenda items for consideration. And then every partner, um, we had run a consensus agenda so every partner was deciding whether they supported or were neutral on the items so that all uh, partners could be associated with all items on the agenda. So that is what led to the agenda that you saw. Um, we have our priorities organized into four categories and the first four bills that we are supporting were specifically designed by impacted communities to advance racial equity. That is at the heart of these first four. Um, those are eliminating suspension and expulsion. That includes both a bill led by the governor's office and also a community led bill that adds more detail and specifics. That's Senate Bill 236, the community led bill. Um, calling upon Congress to keep children and families safe from ICE and establishing a tribal early learning hub. We also drafted a bill to require an equity and access report, um, but we recognize that there's some more work that needs to happen on the data system before that bill's fully ready to move. And so we're working with the early learning division to figure out what the best next step is. So those, those, uh, this category, the first category of legislation, that's our top priority and that's where we're spending our most, most of our advocacy energy. Um, and then of course the second priority, the second category is a high priority as well. And those are the investments that we need to make in the early learning system. Um, those should mostly look familiar. They're very closely aligned with the investments proposed by the governor. I think the only um, substantive difference is um, 
relief nurseries have a request, request to um, enhance salaries, um, as we've started to do with Oregon pre-kindergarten and um, preschool promise. And of course, there's a higher ask for home visiting. Um, but otherwise, these are very closely aligned. So um, like I said, these, especially the first and secondarily the second, those are, that's where we're spending most of our um, advocacy energy, um, writing shared letters, preparing testimony, um, really um, working to mobilize um, parents and providers um, in support. Oh, third, we are also supporting bills to strengthen Oregon child care system, and that work is being led by a child care coalition that we work in close partnership with. Um, we're supporting uh, legislation to reform Oregon's child care subsidy program to protect child care providers who are operating in rentals um, and um, which, um, by the way, you may not be surprised to learn. Um, our, that is a place that um, our communities of color, our providers of color are overrepresented due to historic and longstanding well-documented discrimination and home ownership. And finally, we're supporting legislation to streamline childcare and early learning governance by creating an early learning authority as proposed in House Bill 3073. Um, that um, was a late addition to the agenda. So if you read it a couple of weeks ago, you wouldn't have seen it there even a couple of days ago. Um, we didn't have a partner in the coalition who put it forward in November, so we ran a second process in January to add this important bill to um, our um, shared agenda, and all partners agreed that it was an important addition. Our last category of bills we're supporting are um, bills that support families and communities holistically. One thing um, coalition partners brought was that families um, needed housing, food, and emotional support, and that access to those foundational items had a significant impact on their families' overall well-being and on their children's well-being. So in response to that call to action from coalition partners, we reached out to advocates who lead work in these other sectors to talk with them about whether and how the efforts they were leading would have an impact on children zero to five. Um, and if they did, then we added their advocacy priorities to our shared agenda and we're supporting their efforts. So that's the agenda itself. And then just yesterday, so our timing is impeccable here, we had a really great conversation with the whole coalition about what our shared advocacy approach was going to be. Basically, how are we going to um, create opportunities that work for families and work for providers who are most impacted by the legislation and investments we're advocating for um, to ensure they have the opportunity to engage in the legislative process, which is notoriously exclusionary of people most directly impacted by those decisions. So we agreed on four strategies that we're um, working on together that partners agree will give a better chance for providers and, and parents to, uh, to have their voices heard. One is a social media campaign. There's a really uh, uh, widespread use of Facebook and English and Spanish in particular. Um, and so we wanna make sure we're leveraging that um, access that's been built over years by social media companies um, to give um, families and providers a chance to engage in advocacy. Second is collecting written stories so making it easy to um, have people write down their experiences that are relevant to this year's agenda and um, get those written stories to legislators. The third is video stories. People are really excited about using this uh, format that we think has been underutilized in advocacy in the past and building some collective um, practice around um, working with um, families and providers to videotape their own story and their own words, and then find ways to utilize that in hearings and meetings with legislators and another way to push it into people's inboxes that doesn't require um, total um, written literacy. And then finally, um, you know, we have done in the past lobby days um, and we'll continue to do that this year in this virtual format. Um, so we're getting those on the calendar as well. We want to extend an invitation for council members to join us in any of these uh, activities this session. 
it would be incredibly useful to have your support and, and um, sharing advocacy opportunities with your networks and also in joining us with conversations with legislators in particular. Um, so we'd love to invite you to join us in Coalition Lobby Day or days this year um, as you can. Um, and those will likely take place in early April. We can get back to you with the details. Um, so um, that's all I have to say today. And I welcome your questions or comments about the agenda and also your advice on how we can best support you in being important advocates with legislators. I have a question right at the top about the, uh, the the bill to reduce expulsions and suspensions. How does that work and, and how does the money work with that? Yeah, great question. So um, it's been really great to work with Alyssa Chatterjee in the governor's office and Miriam's team on figuring out the details of this legislation. They have a bill on suspension expulsion that is pretty high level, you know, sets some kind of very high level guidelines and what um, We've been working most closely with Black Child Development PDX to shape the details of this bill. And so what they did was kind of flesh in some of the details. So if the early learning divisions bill says, you know, we need to set definitions of what suspension and expulsion actually is, what do we count as a suspension and expulsion in early childhood? Because we often don't use that those words with families or providers, but that's like in essence what's happening. Um, they said, you know, suspension and expulsion definitions must include these examples. <laughs> um, the early learning division is saying we must collect data and the partners are saying data should include, you know, specific information on disparities, et cetera. So they added some details. The third bucket is professional development and adding some more kind of meat on the bones to what is included in professional development um, and really clarifying that you know, I think we um, value um, expertise that comes along with degrees and training, but we also value expertise that comes along with lived experience and community. And we want both of those to be recognized as a part of a professional development system that um, reduces bias or eliminates bias and, um, and um, strengthens provider skill um, to keep all children in their care. Uh, and finally, um, the community really wants to see suspension and expulsion ended entirely as a practice starting July 1, 2016. So give us some time to build those supports and systems, or sorry, 2026. <laughs> give us some time to build those supports and systems, um, but ultimately say we're not willing to let children experience suspension and expulsion moving forward. We um, recognize the damage that can cause, and um, at some point we have to stop. Um, and so that, that's a community call to action that's, that's different than what the division is putting forward, um, but something was really important to the community members who are participating. We also anticipate some opposition to that piece of the legislation, um, um, but it's something um, the partners we're working with really didn't feel like was um, something that could be compromised. Got you. I think that's great. I, I do think you hit your hit the nail on the, the last comment, Dana, because it's got to be a system change, because if we're requiring uh, providers to uh, deal with children who are who are having really struggles with self-regulation, we have to give them the resources so that they can help those children. And, and it's not it, it's not just professional development, I don't think. I think it's, it's it has to be community wide wraparound type of assistance. Yeah, Miriam, I know you have been very involved in this issue. So do you wanna just add some? Cause that's obviously something council has talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, Peter. I wanted to just build on uh, what Dana was saying and say um, in our publicly funded programs, uh, uh, Preschool Promise, Head Start Oregon, Pre-Kindergarten, um, suspension is not, suspension or expulsion is prohibited. Um, I think the issue is to, Dana's point earlier, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen because there's a lot of soft, you know, expulsion that happens. It's, you know, not compulsory. Um, so, you know, they, <coughs> another colleague I've worked with called it inappropriate goodbye sometimes, you know, to restore, you know, their conversations about like, this is no longer working. Um, so I wanted to say that, um, you know, to you, you, you're, you've hit on something really important about it being system wide. As you know, most of this system is private funded, 
right? So the only lever we have to really enforce a ban would have to be in licensing, right? Would be in childcare licensing that hits most private providers as well as most publicly funded providers, but not entirety, not all of our caregivers in the state. So um, I think that the, the how matters too, because we also have a lot of disparities in the support systems and access to professional development across all of the, and, you know, and not to say that our publicly funded partner, partners who receive public funds or providers get the professional learning and support that they need or TA. Um, but, you know, we, there is not a robust system, right, that it, that reaches the whole mixed delivery system. So I think building up those systems in community that really touch all of these providers that have a very intentional focus on uh, reducing suspension and expulsion, um, through, you know, the assistance and TA and that are grounded in, in, in race. Um, and we also know in um, disparities for children um, with developmental delays and disabilities um, who are also overrepresented. And this population is huge so that, you know, the, the ban has, you know, moves with the capacity, right? Like in community to realize this, I think vision of eliminating suspension and expulsion entirely, as well as the disparities. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good question, Peter. Thanks for raising that. Um, other questions from council members about um, the coalition's agenda, what's on it, what's not on it. Yeah, Anne. No, I, I just on that last point, it sort of raises up the importance of, sort of mental health consultation and mental health support for the mental health system for all of those who are working at that level. And so I, I don't know how that fits into the advocacy agenda, but obviously that's got to be a part of it. And so I'd love to hear Dana talk about that. And then also I have a, I have a really precise question, which is What's happened to the what's happening with the funding for the early learning hubs that restore the 1.4 million? So th I, those are my two questions. Slash. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, the um, the governor's proposed um, 5.8 million dollars um, to support um, reducing, eliminating suspension, expulsion, and so obviously the coalition is strongly support in support of allocating that $5.8 million. And um, a lot of that money um, will be going toward, Miriam can probably correct me or provide more detail, but a lot of that money is specifically going toward um, mental health consultation strategies um, and, and, the, and Black Child Development PDX thinks this is a good piece of the puzzle. Um, they just wanted to make sure that in addition that um, anti-bias piece was layered on top because sometimes the same behavior from a black child or a native child in particular um, and a white child or an Asian American child would be perceived very differently by an educator if there wasn't also a high level of awareness and skill, um, a self-awareness and skill to, um, to perceive the behavior in the same way. Um, so, um, so they, so um, Black Child Development PDX just really wanted to make sure that that both mental health consultation, but also uh, a strong commitment to anti-bias was kind of embedded in multi um, mental health consultation, but but also as a, as a standalone. Um, <clears throat> on the early learning hubs, um, we'll just be advocating through the budget process. We need that funding restored in the. Um, in the um, you know, uh, Department of Education grant and aid budget. Um, and, so we, um, and so we'll be working with the Ways and Means Education Subcommittee and asking for them to restore that funding. And um, fortunately this year, the early learning hubs also have a lobbyist on contract who can really help you know, make sure that request gets the attention that it needs. So is there lobbyist attending the coalition meetings, Dana? I didn't know this. Yeah, one. good question. Um, they've contracted with um, Cassie, I'm spacing her last name, Eames Consulting. Um, and I don't think she has been coming to the coalition meetings, but the early learning hub leaders come to the coalition meetings and then work closely with Cassie. Yeah, okay, okay. 
Um, any other questions of Dana on their agenda? And then we'll go to Kali and then we'll come back to more questions. Uh, yeah, Peter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, thank you. Uh, Dana, I, I'm sure you're, you're uh, tracking the proposal in DC for the, the Biden um, COVID uh, package, which includes the payments to parents with children, uh, monthly payments, parents with children. Um, any early indication of how that impacts what we currently have in terms of support for families um, or is, is just, are you just tracking it at this point? So far, I'm just tracking it. Um, and, you know, we just had someone reach out asking to help and we've worked so little on tax credits because typically tax credits are structured so poorly yep. that we just rather have the money spent directly on the services as opposed to have it come through this back because you know typically they're not refundable typically they only come in april when you, they are refundable they only come in april when you do your taxes um so this is a, a new and i think promising approach but something that we have to learn more about um we've been tracking quite a bit more closely the um the 40 billion dollars um proposed investment in child care which would you know bring more than 400 million dollars to Oregon. Um, that's, that's the piece of the package um, that we've been actively lobbying on that we have um, Congresswoman Bonamici as a really important champion of um, and, um, and that, um, that we've been following most closely. But um, personally, I love the ideas of getting, I love the idea of just getting families more dollars in their pocket um, and letting them have the self-determination to figure out the best way to spend them for their family. Too. Thank you. Yeah, and good question, Peter. And we will be talking about the CCDF funding in half 20 minutes. <laughs> so hold on to that. Um, any, yes, Katie. So I have to ask this question. Please forgive me. But so there are, are several bills um, for tax breaks for um, businesses willing to um, offset costs, pay for partial childcare for their employees and or landlords, welcoming uh, childcare into a facility um, rather than a competing use. It, it, do you have a sense of, of um, the palatability of, of these types of approaches this year? Um. It's a good question. I would say among the child care stakeholders that we've been working most closely with in the child care coalition and in the early childhood coalition, there's not an appetite for tax credits as a leading strategy. They do cost the state money and then they come around to get where you want in a very indirect way. And our preference would be to use any money that would be spent on tax credits instead on direct subsidy so that we could be paying providers adequately, paying them at the beginning of the month, um, paying them to serve more children, um, reducing parent co-pays. And we'd like to see, we're so far from doing that well, we'd like to prioritize spending money on those direct expenditures um, than on tax credits. But, you know, I'm just, this, um, this new proposal to give funding directly to families you know, I think is is really interesting in a way that a tax credit might be done really well. Um, but generally, um, our inclination has been to ask for direct expenditure and have that be the priority for any new spending. Not surprising. One last um, bit of information. Um, it is not ubiquitous across the state, but certainly in Central Oregon and in Bend specifically, 90% of the commercial leases are from out of state. Home prices rose 30% in two months in Bend. Two months. Average home cost is $660,000. And this is occurring in the commercial industry. I've talked to the brokers. They are not going to lease to childcare, period, because they can get twice as much without any risk from somebody from Boston. And so I don't know if tax subsidies or exemptions would, would even touch the surface of this, frankly, but I want just to communicate the severity. I see a train wreck coming, it's here. And I don't know what the answer is, 
but it's it's going to be really hard to get child care up and running. And I don't know if there is legislation or incentives, but I wanted you to know that, you know, just so you have it in your head that the situation here is is pretty, pretty unique. And um, I think it'll take a heck of a lot of money or something. I don't know what to get us out of this hole. I think we certainly have a facilities crisis statewide and particularly acute in communities like Central Oregon. Um, in fact, the, the early learning uh, committee in the house um, asked me to talk earlier today um, about that crisis um, and some possible solutions. We have a bill concept, you know, I know a study is like always like, oh, <laughs> I wish we could do more. But um, we're putting forward a study to start to study, to start to say, okay, get our arms around like, what is the scope of the crisis? And what are some potential solutions so that we can come back with recommendations for action steps? We explored a couple of concrete ideas leading up to the session. We just couldn't get anything to land in time for 2021 specific to facilities. The crisis is not only in commercial space, it's actually, I think it's in home space also, in home spaces, residential spaces. Um, it's why we brought forward the bill to protect childcare providers and rentals. Um, specifically, that bill is also very controversial. You would not be surprised to learn that um, landlords who own homes or duplexes um, strongly oppose any restriction on their ability to decide how they rent those units out. Um, and, um, and we heard, you know, heart-wrenching, tearful testimony from providers, a child care provider who's been providing care out of a rental home, a rental homes for 27 years. And literally is, you know, she's been looking for her new place since October. She's moved in with friends who are now selling their house. She's going to be homeless in 30 days. And she can't find any landlord who's willing to take her in. Um, so there, there is a crisis. Um, we have been, um, I just met with Representative Power this morning, um, and she had a number of ideas, you know, at a minimum, can we protect the child care providers that are currently in rental homes? Can we make sure they have at least six months notice before they have to find a new home? Can we prioritize child care providers for rental, uh, for, um, pandemic uh, uh, rent relief. Um, what are the ways that we can um, make headway on this issue? Um, and, you know, I think sadly, we don't have very much that's like ready to go right now. Um, and it's gonna require, you know, funding ultimately, um, which of course is a, a hard ask right now. I do um, wonder, you know, um, thinking about the federal funds and how to best use like some of the, like hopefully they're not one-time funds. I think we'll make a case to the feds to continue the funding that they've started to give. Um, but uh, I think infrastructure and facilities might be one small piece of the puzzle reopening grants um, that, can, that can help kind of the short-term crunch, but really we need a full plan that addresses um, Head Start, Preschool Promise, home-based childcare, center-based childcare. I mean, we need to really take a comprehensive look and develop a facility strategy that cuts across our mixed delivery system. Yeah, good point. Okay, let's, Kali, do you have your hand up to speak or are you ready to, okay, you're ready to speak. Okay, let's, Dana, thank you. If you don't mind sticking with us or do you need to run to another meeting? No, I'm happy to stick with, I'll just go off video. Okay, thanks. Um, so Kali, uh, as I said, Kali is a member of the Racial Justice Council's Education Recovery Committee. Um, and in our packets, thank you, Remy, we saw the Racial uh, Justice Council's legislative priorities. Among them were the ERC's um, highlights. So Kali, um, thank you for representing the council wherever you go, but also for um, the insights you might offer on what the Education Recovery Committee is recommending. So I think before I jump into that, I just want to say, because you were talking 
earlier. I was going to jump in there. I thought I was going to speak next and then there are more questions, but I, so I don't mean to bring us backwards, but on the federal oh, okay. delegation side, Merkley uh, introduced um, the Perinatal Workforce Act that's part of a Black Maternal Health Bill. Uh, and so just knowing that we have one of our senators really focused on diversifying the perinatal workforce and improving access to maternity care, uh, I think it's very important. And so as we look at what's happening nationally, it's, I just think it's good for all of us to know that um, our senator is championing that. So just yeah. wanted to, it was brought to my attention. I was very excited about it. <laughs> so Great. Um, and we may want to submit a letter supporting support. that. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be great, actually. So, okay, um, thanks, Colleen. And, yeah, so um, the Recovery Committee is a subcommittee of the Racial Justice Council, which was formed uh, around the time that the racial justice movement was sort of at its height in the summertime. And the purpose of this committee was really to focus on. The Racial Justice Council overall looks at racial justice across several areas, and this committee is focused on education. And so it's bringing people um, from across the educational continuum together to look at what are the things that we need to be thinking about uh, to support early childhood, or sorry, support our children <laughs> and diverse children within the educational system. Um, one of the things that has come up, there are a lot of different goals that the council had. I would say on the early learning side, uh, we broke into subgroups and did a lot of brainstorming about the things that were important. And listening to Dana, I was reminded that this year, I feel like, and I don't know if it's because we're in a virtual space, but a lot of people are talking to one another. And so the themes that I, I'm gonna bring similar to what she presented, it's similar to what um, the coalition led by FBO has talked about. It's similar to the Reimagine Oregon framework. So everybody's sort of speaking the same language around what needs to be done to support children in early childhood. Um, the ideas around provider support came up a lot with the committee having living wages, access to anti-racist training, uh, and evidence-based practices that reflect our culturally diverse um, children. Um, there was a lot around family supports and people recognizing the, the role of families as, as first teachers. There was a lot of conversation around facilities investments uh, that we were just talking about and the recognition that we're uh, in a hole there. Um, and then there was a, a conversations around access to birth through five, uh, just some quality programs. <laughs> and so we still having an issue around access. Um, and then the restorative practice piece has come up uh, with this group as well. And I'll move into, I mean, if you have it in front of you, you've seen what the legislative um, pieces are. HB, let me see, HB 2166. Uh, and this, this is, the council was brought together by the governor and appointed by the governor. So what the governor put out in her budget and her priorities were shaped by the council. So um, the HB 2166, it's looking at suspensions and expulsions, creating a centralized system for early care and education programs to support inclusive uh, placements. Uh, and Miriam was also uh, a participant in the, in the uh, recovery committee, so she can add uh, pieces and I'm sure she helped shape this, but um, it, we looked at social emotional learning, educator equity, again, all the things that we've talked about as a council. And I think um, it's just fortunate that um, we, there's that overlap between and, and Miriam on these committees. So we're, again, there's alignment between what our focus is. That's not an accident. It's because there's a lot of strategy so that early childhood has very clear things that they are asking for. Um, and I think we did a good job of trying to hone. I know the, the conversations, my subcommittee groups, I tried to reiterate what I was hearing elsewhere and what the council had as priorities so that there was consistency. Um, the, the tribal... There was a bill um, focused on a tribal learning hub, which is very exciting. There was a lot of conversation around needing to do more to support our Native American um, community. And um, there was 
on the sort of K-12 side, something focused on regalia, and then on the early learning side, wanting to have a hub focus uh, for our tribal communities. So that was another priority. Um, and then what else would I, I mean, the facilities piece is, is big in general. I think the, the assessment uh, was not so much focused on um, early childhood, but I think there is, it came up on the early childhood um, committee, the, the need for facilities, the fact that we have, we just don't have enough buildings. The buildings we have are falling apart. Um, the co-location of early childhood with K-12 is ideal. How do we sort of help support that infrastructure? The housing measures on the table, how do we ensure that um, they're being forced to, to or incentivized <laughs> to, to include early childhood space within? So there was many conversations about that. And then I think the anti-bias restorative practice, we've already talked about it a lot. I don't know that I have a lot more to add other than um, in addition to what Dana said, I think you might recall the study that Yale did also showed it wasn't just that um, they interpret behavior different, but that black children and Native American children are watched more. So people are paying more attention to their behaviors. It's both the interpretation piece, but also that they're garnering the attention of the teacher more. So, you know, a child that can have the same amount of behaviors with the teacher is not paying attention to them. They're not, they're not noticed. And so um, that's another piece, I think, when we were looking uh, with the Reimagined Oregon framework, when we were looking at what is one of the key reasons why we see a pipeline to prison, this idea of sort of the criminalization of the child or you know, pointing a finger at children's behavior at such a young age, how that really does contribute to this pipeline to prison that we see and what we see with juvenile justice later on. And the child's identity as a learner versus a disruptor, uh, because the message that is sent to a child uh, early on is that something's wrong with them or they're disruptive or, you know, they're, they're not wanted. And that has a, a net impact. And I know just qualitatively story after story after story of families who've had this experience uh, with their children um, in early learning, in preschool uh, specifically. Uh, so, I think that's why you see the consistency in that and a real belief that we need training. Um, there was conversations around restorative practice and who gives the training and ensuring that you have diverse communities also offering training and not just um, doing sort of early childhood, the training comes from only certain places. And so there's an understanding that we need to include and, and involve more providers uh, in training uh, so that, and really reflective of all of the diverse groups, diverse communities. So not assuming that one culturally specific training is going to speak for the needs of all cultural groups, knowing how diverse our, our children are. So I think that's all I would say there. There's so much, if you have the packet, you have a lot of information, so I don't want to be overly redundant. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a it's a great packet. Um, and okay, so council questions of Kali on that piece, and any questions of Dana that kind of roll into our legislative priorities and um, the work that we're planning to do with this session and the legislators. I'm just glad there's so much alignment. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's very, that's very powerful. And I think that's how you make progress uh, with the process is if there's alignment and a lot of voices coming at legislators over and over again. Yeah, really good point, Peter. And Dan, as I think about the coalition and think about historically where we were or where we weren't, <laughs> The idea of having 26, seven organizations, 29, I think, yeah. 29 signed on to the same document. I mean, that's almost in the miracle category from an early childhood perspective. So uh, Peter, your point is very well taken and it's taken a lot of work. Um, I know hours and hours of building relationships to get there. So thanks, Dana. Um, Anne, do you have anything from FBO, uh, future, remember what FBO is, 
Foundations, Foundations for a Better, for a better Oregon. Oregon. Thank you. Foundations for a Better Oregon. Um, anything from that perspective regarding workforce or, or just any of this sort of legislative drive for policy or budget? Um, <clears throat> other than to say that I think that FBO wants to be and has tried to be a really good partner in all of this, both, you know, finding the, you know, the, I, from my perspective as a board member of Foundations for a Better Oregon, there's a, a desire to play the right role, some, sometimes as a convener and leader, sometimes as a member of a coalition and sometimes sitting back because because the work that Children's Institute is doing, for example, is so important in terms of the legislative and advocacy agenda. And so Foundations for a Better Oregon is trying to help support the convening and the infrastructure without necessarily trying to take the lead because there are people like Dana who are just extraordinary in taking the lead and, and pushing through the policy agenda and articulating it. So I, I just, I think what the point that Peter made is really important, which is, we're starting to see kind of an alignment, whether you're talking about the coalition or you're talking about the priorities of FBO, Foundations for Better Oregon, or the work that Children's Institute is doing, or the leadership that Miriam is providing. It just feels like there's kind of an alignment that allows us to speak with a much stronger voice and that we're, and that it's coming together. And I think it's, you know, the work that Kali and, and Dana and you, Sue and Miriam are all doing that is really, it seems to be coming together in a, you know, maybe, and maybe I'm naive. So I'd like to sort of put that question back to Dana and Miriam and, and Kali and others, but it just seems like there's more of a consistent, uh, there's consistent talking points. There's a sort of a constant drumbeat. There's a watching over each other. And am, am I being naive or am, am I, is there really something important that's going on in this state? I'd love to jump in if I can. Yeah, Dana, for and sure. I think, I think you're completely, um, what you're saying is completely true. So um, Foundations for a Better Oregon has taken on the facilitation of uh, more K-12, but really a early childhood through K-12 coalition um, that just renamed itself Oregon Partners for Education Justice. And um, I sit on that coalition, but it's really, um, it's largely um, culturally specific community-based organizations that are setting a racial equity agenda um, for early childhood through K-12. And we were able to work in partnership this legislative session um, to have the um, Oregon Partners for Education Justice adopt the racial equity and investment priorities of the Early Childhood Coalition as their early childhood component of their broader agenda. And so it's another place where there is total alignment between what the Governor's Racial Justice Council was advocating for, what the Oregon Partners for, racial Just for Education Justice are advocating for, and what the coalition is advocating for. If you just imagine those first two categories in our agenda, that's like cut and paste into, uh, into their agenda. So we're just um, reinforcing the, the um, messaging and framing and also reinforcing the specific um, policy and budget changes that need to be made. Um, and, and it's just been a really, um, really smart partnership that um, that chalkboard or that Foundations for Better Oregon is leading. Yeah, Exciting. I would add. I mean, my organization also sits on that coalition, and I have been engaged in the conversations. And Amanda, who's their advocacy director, and I have had many conversations um, to make sure that at least the ones that are very specific to the communities we touch are. Are a lot of things. And so there is, I think the key is there's a thread of people who are at various tables saying the same thing. Now, I do wonder, like, what do we do to create a system where that happens that's not as dependent on the individual people? Because I think if anything happened to any of us, we would not have that. <laughs> um, but um, I think for the first time in, in the time I've been doing work in Oregon, I see way more alignment on message across these different tables and an intentionality around it than I've ever seen. So I don't think it's your imagination. I think it's, it's true. 
I, so, I, I, Dana. Oh, sorry. Oops. I just wanted to add something. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying just, just because um, this, this, she's my boss, but I am very grateful to the leadership of Governor Kate Brown on early learning and racial equity. Um, I, you know, I think that has created a lot of opportunity um, to push, I think, an agenda that, you know, myself and I think us as a council aligned with its stakeholders and advocates have been able to, it's, it's a wake, you know, that we can, <laughs> that we can really take advantage of, I think, as she works to really elevate both of these issues in our state. Yeah, excellent point. Oh, we're so lucky she's where she is now. And I know we need to move on. And that's why David actually just popped up on the screen. But, but hold on one second. Dana, um, I appreciate the fact that your coalition is now endorsing the um, House bill. What is that? The one that's 3073. 30, 3073. Um, and will you just tell us in your advocacy role, um, when you testify before Powers Committee, what will you say is the greatest benefit of creating um, an early learning or early care and education authority? So separate from ODE. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, um, I think the biggest thing is, you know, <laughs> there is rapid and um, foundational brain development happening in young children, zero to five. And the state commitment of creating an agency that is completely dedicated to making sure that goes well and there's um, equitable access to the things that we know work um, to support children to thrive in those earliest years, that's, that's critical, that's historic, it's monumental. It's what states who see dramatic progress are doing is really dedicating and focusing in that way and having a state agency completely focused on those years we think is foundational and then of course um then giving that agency the authority over the programs well designed to do that is also critical so i think moving um, the ERDC program into that new authority. That's the other piece um, that we see is so important. And our key point there is um, in order to get the, um, um, the, the benefit, I hate to put it in like financial terms, but the, the um, um, in order to, for kids to thrive in the way that we want them to thrive, um, we need to be fully leveraging, coordinating, um, making sure all of the investments that we make work together really seamlessly for children, families, and providers. And having them under one roof um, is a really important step in, in making sure they work well together. Okay, thank you. And Miriam, I know you could talk for a while about that question, but um, we'll come back to that at some point. Okay, so let's um, thank Dana very much for joining us and um, all of the work that you're doing. You are making a huge difference um, for kids and families in the state. So we appreciate you a lot. Thanks, Thanks. you guys are as well. Thanks for the time today. And Kali, thank you for representing the RJC um, committee for us. So thank you. And now we get to talk about how to spend 103 million new dollars. So drum roll for, um, oh, David. Yeah, no, I thought it, since we're actually gonna try to do a couple different things in the next 30 minutes, I thought it just might be useful to give a little bit of a preview of the conversation. Um, um, as Sue was just referencing, uh, and I think came up earlier in the today's conversation, uh, Oregon uh, has received additional uh, federal funding through Child Care Development Fund in December. This isn't the first part of uh, federal relief that we received. So Miriam's going to provide a little bit of overview of that funding. And then we wanted to uh, provide an opportunity to also um, uh, get some input from all of you on priorities around those funds. So we're going to do a little bit of um, breakout rooms and a little uh, small group discussion on that. And then we're gonna come back together because in addition to that element of CCD of the Child Care Development Fund, uh, we are also 
in the process of developing the the next uh, child care development fund, which happens every three years, and uh, really want to engage the council in a deeper conversation in April about the about the state plan. But wanted to provide just a little bit of setup and context um, so we can really use your time most effectively when we reconvene on that topic in April. And with that, I will hand it over to uh, Miriam. Great, thanks, David. Um, so I'm gonna just do an overview of the different, all the different kind of funds that have come in um, that have been leveraged, um, some specific to childcare and some um, with the support of our governor and legislature to direct more uh, funds to stabilize um, childcare providers through the pandemic. Um, it's funny because I, I presented on this earlier to house early childhood family supports after Dana talked about childcare facilities. So it's been a little bit of Miriam and Dana show today. So, um, on a number of these factors. Uh, so um, you can see here um, sort of three different um, uh, sort of pots of funds. Um, the first two, the COVID relief um, funds, CRF and CARES Act funds, um, came both came under the CARES Act. So I would say this, um, both are, we received um, uh, you know, the legislation passed in March, we sort of, this is sort of early spring, earlier on in the pandemic. Um, the middle column CARES Act, this was specific um, to childcare. So through the Child Care Development Block Grant or CCDF, as you see here, and the coronavirus relief funds were um, a broader set of funds that went to state and local governments to be able to support um, pandemic response efforts. Um, and so uh, I, I will talk about Consolidated Appropriations Act in just a moment. That's the new money um, that David was just referencing and that we'd like to get um, a sense of um, your priorities and ideas on. So um, most, what you see with the CRF funds, um, there were primarily two action, two action e-board actions in June and November um, that directed the Early Learning Division to provide funds, direct financial assistance um, for the to child care businesses that were open and operating or seeking to reopen to stabilize them during the pandemic. Um, the um, legislate federal legislation required that this that all of these funds be um, liquidated by the end of the calendar year. Um, they did pass a bill, the same bill, Consolidated Appropriations Act, that provided an extension to that. But um, we were so, but that extension didn't come until the end of December. And we were so already on the road to <laughs> dispersing all of those funds. So um, the balance on that is zero because we have been able to disperse, um, you know, close to $74 million to um, child care providers, um, over 3000 and licensed um, and recorded program providers, as well as 1,500 um, license exempt, you know, ODHS, um, family, friend, and neighbor um, providers. So um, those funds are, that balance is liquidated. Um, the CARES Act fund, again, same bill as CRF, of, the, of those CRF funds. These, these monies came through CCDF discretionary dollars. There were um, allowable, you know, specified allowable uses um, and that generally very similar to what I talked about, we use with the CARES Act funds. Um, these resources have also been used to um, cover the cost of our emergency, um, temporary and emergency rule changes for the ERDC program. So the zero co-pays, the um, increased income eligibility limits, the more flexible um, payment practices are for providers. You can see there we have um, until 2023 to liquidate those funds and obligate by 2022. Um, we really, I think, um, as a state uh, benefited from, you know, or I guess, you know, the, the CRF investment allowed us to get dollars to providers through funds that we at the time needed to be expended quickly and kind of gave us more opportunity and availability to be able to plan for CARES Act CCDF funds because we had a longer time frame to, to spend those. So um, in January, the e-board um, approved um, some spending, you know, a spending plan uh, for most of these funds, or it is still an $8 million um, remaining balance. Um, but these are funding 
for example, the supply building activities um, that we are, you know, uh, will be um, putting out to communities um, very soon. Um, it's again covering ERDC policy changes, as I said. The telehealth line that launched for all childcare providers around the state this week, in partnership with OHSU, sort of is another example of how we're using these funds around pandemic response. Um, and then. Um, the pot of funds that we want to talk about today, we got the award um, notice of award um, in early February. Um, these are new new one time funds again in this new federal bill that are going through the same mechanism of CCDF. Um, the feds um, in this bill and Congress aligned the obligation and liquidation periods and largely have had the same kind of allowable uses. Um, there is a new requirement to submit a spending plan by February. 27th. Um, so we're, we're working again on along the line that those deadlines as well. So that that is something new kind of in that bill, um, as well as um, we have some other internal deadlines around um, any um, use of, of these federal stimulus funds um, that have an impact in this biennium. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, you know, this is again, I just covered this. This is sort of the breakdown of, of again, the largest, you know, investment has been in direct financial assistance um, and our um, ERDC um, policy changes. Um, we are very much thinking about, and I'll say something that is emergent a priority, and you'll see in this document as we go into breakout groups, um, both how to continue to cover um, the costs of. Um, the emergency policy changes through the duration of the state of the emergency, which we know has an indeterminate end date at this point. Um, and so um, that is at not that is one priority that we have heard clear, clearly from stakeholders pretty consistently um, through this emergency. And the other is a transition from zero copays. I think as, as the council knows, um, we have, um, uh, some of the highest co-pays um, in the nation for our child care subsidy program. Um, and so we have been um, at zero. We have seen um, more en enrollment in the program. So caseloads going up. Now, since those co-pays have been at zero, we've also seen families, um, higher income, not high income families, but families above even 150% of poverty that are starting to participate in the program, we think is directly attributable to co-pays. And so something we've heard consistently is as a potential priority for this new money, um, how would we transition to a fair um, at, you know, better copay uh, policy and structure with some of these funds as, as we move out of this emergency so we don't go from zero copays back to really, really high copays, right, for any new family. So um, were that to emerge as a priority, I really wanted to call that out because that would be, you know, a significant um, expense of the $103 million. Were we to not only use some funds to get through the rest of this emergency with zero copays, but also to transition to a fairer um, copay policy in this next biennium. So that's all. Okay, so David, are we going into breakout groups now or Remy, whoever, who's running this part? I believe so. Just wanted to also make sure that if um, folks had any questions about that um, money before we went into breakout uh, groups, um, chance to ask them. Sure. Yeah. David, Peter. can can the funds, uh, how flexible are they? Could, could they also address workforce issues such as, you know, could could there be uh, bonuses for child care providers? Yeah, uh, Peter, as long as we don't call them bonuses, <laughs> we call, um, absolutely. Um, I think we've been talking about extra duty pay or things. So yeah, that's an allowable expense. I would say the there's a broad range of, of, of expenses that really are attributed, uh, you know, that have to do with helping providers reopen, manage debt um, from lower enrollment or high, cover higher operating expenses. We've used it in our state to purchase PPE, you know, we've used it to help more cover more families. So the income eligibility is now up to 250% of federal poverty, right, to be eligible to enter the subsidy program. So we could cover more essential workers. Um, but again, the lion's share has gone through dire uh, to direct financial assistance to providers and to the ERDC changes. 
and, and since I think this came up in the earlier conversation, I think one place where there are or is limitations around facilities use. So I think that is a place where there's an, an important limitation. Okay. And I don't know how it factors in that this is one-time money, or at least we think it's one-time money. So um, then we'd have to be trying to build it into the state, you know, CS, the current service level, if yeah. possible. And before we go into breakout um, uh, rooms, just a couple other pieces, just in terms of the mechanics of the spending. Um, you know, I think uh, Miriam talked about the period over which the money can be spent. We do need to submit a fairly high level plan to the, um, to the Federal Office of Child Care by uh, February 27th and uh, for resources that are gonna be used for this um, biennium, we also need to start that conversation with the legislature this week. So those are also just some of the time pieces that we're working under. No urgency here. <laughs> we'll talk really fast, David. We so need all is... your great ideas today. <laughs> today. In the next 10 minutes. So right. this is a rapid fire input for staff to incorporate in their thinking. Um, okay, so what are, are we doing like 10 so minutes? I think we're gonna do 10, uh, 10 minutes of two breakout rooms. And I think uh, we have staff on hand to help with notes and we have a shared document to put those in. And I think Remy is gonna send us in our, on our way. Yes, we will return at 4.40 and um, here you go.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. So, David. Was fast. <laughs> <laughs> sure was fast. <laughs> David, do you want us to debrief that or do you want to just move on to the next piece? I think we could do about three or four minutes of, deep, of debrief, and I'll try to be really quick on the CCF overview presentation. But because I just, you know, that that's just really in the spirit of um, setting you guys up for April. Okay. So, do you want to? How do you want to do? Do you, David, want to do group two? And I don't know, Carrie or Remy, you were doing group one. I'll bet. So do you want to just throw out the ideas that the group? So, 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 so I'm happy to start with group two. Uh, folks were disappointed that the funds can't be used for facilities. Um, so I think that's just clearly a need. Um, uh, I think there was a appreciation for thinking about how to use the resources in this transition period, both around the co-pays and continuing to help provide resources directly to providers to help them um, you know, still deal with the additional costs associated with the guidelines. Uh, a lot of discussion around workforce. Uh, how, is there a way to use resources to help pr providers bring new, uh, new people into the workforce? Is there a way to use resources to help with community colleges or other um, you know, opportunities, particularly thinking not just about tuition, but the broader set of costs, uh, particularly for someone who's actually working to, you know, access um, degree programs. And then also a discussion of um, uh, resources for thinking about student parents and their needs for childcare and uh, Anne brought up in rural communities that a high percentage of students are non-traditional. Thank you, David. So, Gary. yeah, so our group also endorsed the ERDC policy changes about sustaining them through their emergency um, and then thinking about the transition. We spent some time really thinking about the emergency grants to childcare and how do we really help small businesses how, to, how does it have streamlined, limited criteria? If the programs have remained open, they're savvy, they're wary about taking on more debt. So it's really about how to trust them, have, have it be clear about what they're saying they want and do, but then trust them to do that. Um, and then we were just having a conversation about some of the other supports around the childcare programs that might help with equity. So if there's things around access of food or materials, and George, I missed the last couple of words you said before we got transitioned to the other room, but really thinking about some of those additional needs um, of the child care program or the families that they're serving. George, do you want to expand on that? Oh, I, I just think, you know, food, nutrition, extra time learning, extra support, mental health services, social, emotional, uh, things that provide access to resources, um, bridging that gap as much as you can. Um, you know, in that part, I never got to, to end on the part with the, the facility side. We didn't get into that discussion, but I definitely feel like that is probably one of the highest needs with the potential for expansion or sustained services with one-time funds. Um, and it would be one of these things where I'd be, well, where is the statute or where is the regulation or where is this requirement that says you can't? And then have it very clearly listed why you can't. Because you could even think about this is a good time to do facilities repairs or facilities improvements, different things with HVAC systems for, for safety, for wellness, for health. Like th this is a time where one-time funds can do a lot of things to bridge that gap um, as well as with technology. So, so I, I'd be somewhere in that thinking of, of how do I get these kinds of things to happen when I might not have um, sustained funds for that. We're going to send you to Washington, George. <laughs> I, actually, it's interesting. I just want to say George is making an interesting point because while there is a statutory prohibition on capital, there are some things within it that probably are related to COVID-related enhancements that would be doable and maybe calling them out a little bit more in terms of the potential allowable uses might be helpful for the flexible emergency, whatever the fund is, 
to help people because it can be very confusing for people to know what they are permitted to spend on and what they're not in that particular area. Yeah. And I think um, uh, in particular, Senator uh, Wyden's leadership on um, on Senate finance might be really helpful um, to make to make that point because I think George, the prohibition is because it's going through CCDF and sort of underlying law of CCDF, not necessarily um, yeah. for any other reason than that. So you know, other there are other mechanisms to get you know dollars to states. And I think it might be a good transition point to the discussion of CCDF state plans and that's where a lot of the rules come from. Okay, um, let me but, let Kali, Kali yeah. wants to make a comment. I, well, I had a question. I mean, uh, can we get a point of clarification that I didn't assume that they couldn't be used for upgrades to meet COVID. There's so many health requirements uh, on COVID. I, I guess I assumed that that was an allowable expense and and are you saying it's not? Because that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But and, yeah. I, and I would say for schools, schools are allowed to do facilities improvements uh, with HVAC, uh, right. with with I'll just say equipment, right. with machines, with right. technology that helped enhance air quality. Right. And it would be odd to me that um, you just. I, I know you're saying CCDF and other rules, but maybe even a, a waiver um, or some kind of a a regulation that allows it to happen during this time. Yeah. Well, and I think, right, I think it's timely right now to look at the way they're structuring the 1.9 trillion proposal that um, the next sort of COVID stimulus, because, you know, we're uh, can be making assumptions right now that all of it is going to go through CCDF and maybe it's not. So, you know, I think now is a good moment to, I think, engage the congressional delegation and ask some of those questions. Awesome. Okay, David, do you, do you want to tell us about the next $400 million or what do you want to do? Or this hundred million? Do you want to put up the PowerPoint? Thanks, can you go to the next slide? So as I said, um, every three years, uh, states are required to submit a CCDF state plan. Um, so this is, and we really want to engage the council in, in that and get your input in April. So this is just a little bit of overview of what that means. Next, next slide, please. So again, let's just, uh, the general purpose of the Federal Child Care and Development Fund, uh, two main purposes, it's to support families in accessing uh, child care and offsetting the cost of that. And it's also to really support states in building the quality of child care and the supply of child care in the state. Next slide, please. So just a look, quick overview. Uh, the Early Learning Division is the lead state agency for the Child Care Development Fund. Uh, Oregon receives about 200 million per, my, per biennium in CCDF, and somewhere in the order of about 70% of those funds uh, are transferred from the Early Learning Division to the Department of Human Services for, the, for employment related daycare. So, CCDF is our main uh, source of funding for child care assistance. State also does put in some general fund to support uh, employment related daycare. And then also uh, the Child Care Development Fund is also a uh, main support uh, source of uh, Oregon investments in child care licensing, technical assistance, quality improvement, professional learning. Um, the child care resource and referral system, for example, is really um, almost completely funded out of, our, um, out of the Child Care Development Fund. So this really is, uh, significant source of funding um, for early care and education in the state. Next slide, please. So what is this, uh, the CCDF state plan? So, um, so it is sort of maps our state's response to the federal requirements and in some sense it's our official application to the to the federal government for these resources. So I think one way to sort of think about the CCDF plan is in some sense, it's a 
survey of all of the policies related to the Child Care Development Fund across the state. Um, and um, so, I th so I think, but that being said, I think, so it's really, in some sense, you're telling back to the federal government, the state of how things are in terms of policy choices in the state. And it really runs the gambit from really big important uh, pieces of policy that I you know, know the council will care about, like things like copay structure, um, to things like, tell us what's the random number generator that you use when you pull files to make sure that you're doing your accountability tests. So it's a 300 page document, but in doing uh, the state plan, it's really a great opportunity to step back, take stock of where we are and what direction that we wanna head. Um, and so while we submit the state plan every three years, we're not bound by those policy choices that we submit in the state plan. The state can amend the state plan at any point during those three years. But I, think, but I think what that means is the process of doing the state plan is a real opportunity though, just step back and take a look at where you are, even if it's really mostly about reporting the state of, of, of how things, of current policy, rather than about asking you where you're gonna go in the future. Um, next slide. So this is just a little bit about the calendar. Um, we need to post the plan 60 days uh, prior uh, for a public comment. So that would be uh, back in March. Uh, there's a requirement for a formal public hearing in April. We also want to engage the council in April and in input session, opportunity to incorporate changes in May, and then need to formally submit the, pl the plan on July 1st for it to go into effect on October 1st. Um, so in, in addition to the formal public hearing and uh, engagement with the council, uh, we will also be engaging stakeholders, uh, working with our union partners to engage childcare providers, parents and caregivers uh, and other organizations. Uh, and you know that will also all just provide input for the plan. Um, and I don't, uh, so then I just want to end a little bit on uh, thinking on uh, sort of the crosswalk we've been doing to help structure this work with the Raise Up Oregon plan. Go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the plan has eight sort of formal sections with large numbers of questions in each section. So we've gone through each of those eight sections of the plan and done a crosswalk uh, with Raise Up Oregon. Go to the next slide. In your council packet that was sent out in advance of this meeting, uh, you'll find that crosswalk for each of the eight sections of the plan. Um, and today I'm just gonna walk through a couple examples. So first sections around CCDF leadership and coordination and uh, there are questions in there that really touch on the council's priorities around strengthening childcare assistance programs, around strength and coordination among early care and education, health and housing, on the state and community local connection uh, and prioritization of resources. Go to the next slide. Uh, if go to section three on provide stable childcare, financial assistance to families, that section really connects really closely to the goals in objective two, that families have access to high quality, culturally responsive, inclusive, developmentally appropriate, affordable, early care and education that meets their needs. Uh, and go to the next slide, just as last example. Uh, in section five on health and safety, uh, questions uh, you know, related to building the state's capacity to to ensure that childcare are healthy and safe in childcare. So really key questions around child, the state's licensing system, how we're addressing safe sleep practices uh, and you know, connecting to the following priorities. So I think our goal when we come back in April and I'll be working with Sue and Harriet is to you know, not force you to engage in all 300 pages of the plan or talk about random number generators, but to lift up that conversation to really see, you know, as we're taking stock, what are some of the 
priorities um, that the council sees moving forward. So I think that's all I have. Okay, thank you, David. So council members, obviously that's a huge um, commitment of staff time, but we will just need to have enough of an understanding of it in April so that we can say, yes, we like where we've been and where we are and endorse that. David said, it's not a look into the future. It's really an assessment of where we are. So but it'll be a great document. Not, we yeah. will have a lot to learn. But I think it is an opportunity to hear from the council where we want to, where you want to move in the future. So I, th I think it's, you know, I think it's an opportunity to take what's in part of bureaucratic responsibility and really use it as a meaningful planning and strategy conversation. Great. And you'll be one of the few states trying to embed your strategic plan in your CCDF plan, which is what everyone should be doing. But I can help you to understand already, it is not the norm. So in this way, you'll continue to be a pathbreaker. And hopefully by doing this with this plan, it'll be an encouragement for your sis the sister agencies with their kinds of plans that they're submitting for other various federal funds to try to infuse some of your raise up or their raise up Oregon frame into their plans as well. So I'm just awesome. trying to make it more exciting. It's, it is more exciting than it might seem. Okay. Um, just to give a different spin on it. <laughs> uh, and I, yeah. And I would say too, how much are we always constantly talking about like what we are learning from, from this pandemic about childcare and sort of small silver, you know, what's kind of silver linings of, of build back better and stronger. So while it isn't like a, this, you know, fully, we'd have to do an amendment to say something we don't know yet that we want to do. I think it is an opportunity, as David said, you get a good take stock and to integrate what we were just doing and what we've been learning through this pandemic about what childcare needs to be equitable and stable and more robust in our state and, you know, sort of nudge <laughs> of, you know, is this, is this something um, that we, you know, we want to continue to see this way, or is it something that we want to integrate what we've learned and, you know, and um, start talking about how to move more in the future. So um, I think, awesome. and then I think maybe Harriet, I'm gonna volunteer you, um, maybe if any council member would want anything in between now and April, just to, you know, um, boot camp or more readings or things like that around kind of CCDF. Um, wait, okay. yeah, I think we definitely support that too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We now have um, 90 seconds left for <laughs> Tammy. Hi, Tammy. You know what, I only need two minutes. So if you'll give me an extra 30 seconds, I think we're good. It's all yours. Thank you. So <laughs> thank my name you. is Tammy Scott. I'm um, the current acting co-director for Office of Child Care and I have a couple of rule definition updates. My camera's a little off um, to just bring forward to your attention for you to consider. Um, in, in um, supporting us with our rules. So we, we sent you a memo that outlined a, a couple of definitions that we need to do some updates on. Um, one of them is for our regulated subsidy providers. Those are providers who are not required to be licensed, but they are caring for children that are on employment related daycare um, subsidy. Uh, through uh, ODHS. And so what was brought to our attention is that our definition on the regulated subsidy rules that are around the health and safety, um, we were quoting an infant definition or a definition of childcare children that started at age six weeks and cuts off at age 12. And ODHS um, caught that after four years that we've been using this rule because it had never, it, we haven't had any problems in terms of and how it's working out in the world because they will do payments for children younger than six weeks of age. Um, so they asked that uh, we consider updating that definition that would allow them um, to continue to care for children under six weeks. And then the other thing with ODHS is they have what's called 12 month eligibility. So when a, um, a family is eligible to receive um, ERDC subsidies, they're actually eligible for 12 months, even if there's a change in their status. And if the child turns um, 13 during that 12 months, they're able to continue to pay for that child care during that full year of eligibility. But our child care definition cut them off at 12 years. So we're really just wanting to update that definition to align it with ODHS's payment policies so that they're synced up. 
Like I said, this has been an error for four years and it hasn't actually caused any payment problems because nobody realized it, but we want it to be accurate and correct. And awesome. That these will come back to you in the spring. So we just wanted to, in the spirit of never asking you to make a decision before you've actually had a chance to at least get a preview. Yep, a this is a preview heads up of, of my official asking in the spring. Um, and then the second update that is actually within our child care licensing rules, registered family child care licensing rules um, define an infant as age six weeks up to age 12 months. And then when they hit 12 months, they fall into the toddler definition. And certified family and certified um, center definitions for an infant state that it's age six weeks until the child is walking. And it's just really not a good way to define out what an infant is because some children will never walk. And so that, that definition, it got updated in registered family in 2014, but certified family and certified center haven't gone through the same process. We have it on the list, but it just has been a problematic definition. So that's the other one that I'd like you to consider so that we have those aligned and it's based on an age and not about an ability. All right, you've got it. We look forward to seeing you again in April, Tammy. <laughs> I had two, I think I took three minutes. It's okay. Thank you very much. And thanks for waiting till the end of the day. Oh, no problem. Long, long, exciting afternoon. <laughs> so council, thank you all for hanging in there. Thanks for your input, questions, etc. cetera. Um, obviously a lot of things to follow up on, which are very exciting. And um, we should have a good legislative session ahead of us, right, Madam Director? Yeah. So we're very lucky. I don't know if you track Miriam at all, but she's basically living at home, but in the legislature, much of her waking hours. So thank you, Miriam. Kali. Are there any, are there any bills that you want written testimony or verbal testimony by the council, from the council, um, or like by individual members or the council as a collective? And Yes, that is the, is the short answer. Um, in fact, Monday is the hearing for the governance bill and the ERDC bill. So Monday will be a big afternoon and um, Alyssa in the governor's office is coordinating along with Rep Power um, what the testimony will look like, but Kali, hopefully you're somewhat on board. I think you and I are gonna co-present for the council. I sent you a text about that, but we'll see. <laughs> so I'm really glad you asked that question, Kali. <laughs> it's really timely. Um, but Harriet and Miriam and I have been working on kind of a, a plan and a structure for how to get council input into some of the key legislative bills. So, um, and David and Remy are part of that. So we will be in touch because it's a very timely question. And I also know we're now four minutes over time. So anything else urgent before we close out? Okay. Thank you, Carrie and Harriet. Thank you again for helping to put this whole four hours together. And I hope all of you stay safe and have a relaxing evening. Ahead. Thanks everybody. Take care. Thank you for a great meeting. Yeah, bye-bye.